2020, Belarusians organized a real digital resistance. Human rights activists collected information about the repressed through chatbots. People identified the names of KGB officers with the help of artificial intelligence. Communication between the protesters took place without the internet, using Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Enthusiasts intercepted police talks and warned protesters. The GOLAS system was created for the alternative counting of the votes, which proved that Lukashenko was defeated in this election. When Russia started the war against Ukraine, many Belarusians joined the partisan movement. They conducted more than 80 acts of sabotage on railways in order to disrupt the movement of Russian troops. Partisans coordinate through the special digital system built by brilliant IT specialists. It's also the achievement of partisans that the Russian army didn't feel safe in Belarus and gave up on its plan to take Kiev. Meanwhile, Belarusian, <coughs> Belarusian cyber partisans disrupt the state infrastructure without risking lives or even being physically present inside the country. They managed to slow down the Russian army, making Russian tanks and cars stand for days under Kiev without petrol. Our cyber army has already given us evidence of how the regime killed Belarusians during the protests or tortured people in prisons. Besides, uh, thanks to our cyber army, now we know the names, addresses and telephone numbers of those executors. Valuable information for the unavoidable trials. And a good way to signal to the Belarusian Gestapo, each crime will be investigated. We know that it cools down the otherwise unchecked violence. And now, when hundreds of Belarusians had to flee our country, we are becoming in a way of e-nation. We are trying to educate our children in national language online, raise funds for the Ukrainian and Belarusian refugees online, conduct our businesses and publish new Belarusian books, all electronically, while physically we are scattered across the world, from Prague to Tbilisi, from Stockholm to Tel Aviv. Our strong community is also attempting to build the first democratic state of Belarus in exile. Our goal is to help our citizens in times of crisis and to create the foundation for a future state while involving people into the process by showing the simplicity and ease of democratic institutions to work. To ensure the unity of Belarusian community and to strengthen its democratic values, we are launching soon a digital state, a project called Digital Belarus. This platform may later become an Estonia-like European e-government system to support democratic institutions and procedures to provide citizens a meaningful voice in governance while increasing efficiency, transparency and citizen participation. I know that the Czech Republic has welcomed many Belarusian students after the protests and repressions in 2020. Many of these young men are studying information and communication technologies here, and I'm grateful to the Czech government for making that possible. And I want to use this opportunity uh, and call on Czech government to support Belarusian students with scholarships and visas. Most Belarusian students studying abroad are already involved in volunteering for the independent Belarus, which means there is no way back to the occupied motherland for them. It so happened that digital technology has become our ally at this time. So let's use them to the full to save democracy, liberate Ukraine and make Belarus free. Without a free Ukraine and Belarus, there will be no free Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very moving um, keynote speech. Um, já moc děkuji. Uh, tady právě vidíme, jak technologie.
Thank you very much. Uh, this actually shows us that technologies could help us not only in the time of peace, but also um, during the war. And now I would like to welcome the next keynote speaker, who is Deta Charanzová, who is the vice president and member of the European Parliament. The floor is yours. And we look forward to your speech. Thank you very much, Sara. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased that we actually see each other face to face. Ever since the beginning, I am has been I have been participating in this conference and this is like the seventh or eighth year and it's great that um, digital Czech Republic uh, is still a priority it used to be a priority of the previous government and it is the priority of the current government I always try to find what is the position of the Czech Republic um, there is the uh, digital economy index uh, that gives you ranking and the Czech Republic ranks 18th that's average on the international scene we are between Israel and Chile where well, we are good and I congratulate that uh, these are Czech companies, Czech businesses in e-commerce, and we are one of the leading countries. And that's why we actually organized this uh, conference and we discuss topics on how to improve the digital environment, we politicians. What is good is integration of digital technologies. What are the weaknesses? Costs of broadband internet the highest in Europe and the second and that's uh, also a challenge it's a uh, lack of skilled experts as it slows down the economic development of the Czech Republic I work in Brussels so I would like to say also a couple of words about Brussels. Uh, we have succeeded in adopting a piece of legislation that is the largest one in the last uh, 20 years. We uh, adopted the Digital Market Act and the Digital Services Act. The Digital Market Act is about setting um, fair conditions to open up uh, the environment also for smaller players and to make it more user friendly uh, so that for example we want to uninstall predefined applications or to use FaceTime when calling via WhatsApp etc. The Digital Services Act looks at um, how to set up the rules for both large players and smaller players that will cover, for example, Cessna, Mall, Heureka, these Czech businesses. And the Czech businesses um, follow the process to make sure that all is set up properly. The main rule is that if uh, there is something illegal in the offline world, it must be illegal also in the online world. It sounds pretty easy, but uh, it was not the case. So the large platforms will be forced to erase illegal contents. And also we see the role of technological companies not only in the world of e-commerce, but also in our life in international policy and foreign policy. They are with us um, in a way we could, for example, follow what is going on in Ukraine. We see every day President Zelensky. But on the other hand, we also see spreading of Russian propaganda here in Europe. And that is the objective of this new piece of legislation uh, to prevent spreading, for example, of Russian propaganda. Uh, just to uh, wrap up what uh, we did, we wanted to uh, show clearly that no technology giant is above law. And the larger the giant, the larger the uh, responsibility, social responsibility. Uh, digital companies are no digital islands. They are part of our lives. 
But this is not the end. Uh, we are looking into the rules in the area of AI um, and other uh, topics, and I am glad that this conference will focus on them in detail. Uh, why is Europe doing that? Because if we do not do it, then the businesses uh, will work on 27 different digital markets. We won't have our single European market. And when I compare the European market, it's the largest uh, digital market. I put aside China and India. Uh, these are p perhaps not the markets we want to compare ourselves. Uh, we have by 150 million more users than in the US. And if we manage uh, to set uh, single rules so that the Czech company would know that the same rules apply in Spain and Sweden, then Europe uh, can grow more. To conclude, I would like to say that in the past uh, 20 years, um, um, is the period uh, of um, digital technology growth. And that's the backbone of all innovations. And what we need is uh, for the Czech Republic uh, to be the place for innovations. And that's the objective of the current government as well. We need to uh, be the creator, not just the consumer. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much. I would shake your hand, but I don't have my hand free. We have opened quite an interesting topic. That's the role of technologies for the normal citizen and what impact does the digital society have on the organization of the government. And this is the room for Ivan Bartosz. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister for Digitalization and Minister for Regional Development of the Czech Government. So the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is the first time I am presenting at this conference, and this is my first time for presentation of the steps and visions of the Czech Government. I must admit that also, the previous governments understood the importance of digitalization, both in the national terms and, and in the national context and in the European context. And I'm very glad that uh, the Czech Republic has been quite active in uh, promoting the European legislation. I think that we have learned our lesson from GDPR. At the same time, we all understand that until recently, we really walked and progressed slowly. But over the COVID period and now with uh, the war in Ukraine, we realized how important digitalization is, digitalization of the government services, because it's the government that enters into the life of the citizens, of businesses, um, businesses which may not be digital at all, still need to communicate with the government and its institutions and authorities. So I'm quite glad that the COVID crisis indeed showed that digitalization is not an island of positive uh, deviation, that it is not something that originates from Brussels, but it really is important for collaboration between the government and the business and with the NGOs and all the players in the field. Each of these players have their experience, which can be transferred and shared. And this kind of collaboration and sharing of experience and knowledge and expertise will help to set up a user-friendly ecosystem. It is important to have the ecosystem secure for the future against external uh, enemies, for example, but also from, in, from inside. And the important thing is that it is a citizen, an individual with their rights that is in the focus. 
which has not always been the same, but it is aligned with the European uh, thinking where the citizen is the focus and the important element. And hopefully in the Czech Republic, thanks to this government, we are going to take over this perception. I would like to focus on four major uh, aspects that will probably be reiterated throughout the conference. The first item is the Digital Czech Republic. It is a strategy or concept that we have been promoting for several years already. And I have contributed to it also from my opposition role. And uh, I believe that digitalization should not bear any political label. It is a must. We need to accelerate it, to accelerate the collaboration, to have the collaboration as intense as possible. Of course, the Czech Republic is no island. Digitalization is an extremely important pillar. Uh, we have allocated some 40 billion Czech crowns uh, for digitalization, for uh, e-government, uh, and e-government is in extremely important. It was quite visible over the COVID era that uh, it's not enough to have the services in place, but they need to be user-friendly, they need to be accessible and available. And it all has to work reliably and fast. Digital economy and society is another aspect. We have to uh, design legislation which is user-friendly, which must have room to the citizens and to businesses. There must be room for support and promotion to digital transformation. And it is a challenge for each individual country, a member state in uh, the EU. I'm very glad that uh, digitalization has become one of uh, the priorities of the current government. And actually, uh, electronic identity is one of the priorities. And hopefully, with this, we will be able to vote in the Czech Republic, book a hotel in Austria, and establish a business anywhere in the European Union. And there will be many other services that relate to it, the, like driving licenses or university diplomas. And hopefully, we will gradually get there. Uh, I would be very happy if uh, during the Czech presidency we were able to uh, present the ambitious, not only present the ambitious uh, objectives and targets in digitalization. And I think that the uh, mindset, international mindset will be the driver. Uh, the cyber security will also get more and more importance. The more data we have uh, online, the more security we need. And of course, another main challenge is uh, the digital economy, including artificial intelligence. And that this is no f far, far future. Finland has been using AI in e-government. This will uh, require additional legislation, such as the Data Act or CHIP Act that uh, the EU is preparing. And this will structure the uh, environment for the European market. Let me once again repeat what may have become a cliche. The current crisis will be extremely hard. With, in the aftermath of COVID with the war in Ukraine, but we should grasp it as an opportunity, both on the national and European level, and we should take this opportunity to extremely accelerate digitalization. And to conclude, I would like to say 
that the best choice of this transformation is in people, in their uh, know-how, in their education, upskill, and this is what will help us uh, stand up to the current challenges, whether it is uh, disinformation, robotization, which will help replace manual work, all kinds of digital uh, companies need more and more experts. And I hope that the Czech Republic will be able to offer not only investment, but also a uh, friendly legal environment and will offer an environment welcoming educated, highly qualified experts. And the uh, knowledge society is an important prerequisite for a growing uh, society. And hopefully, we can move from the 18th position up to, let's say, the first top 10. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your speech. You actually helped me a lot uh, because uh, you have already uh, presented uh, the next panel on the way from the assembly plant to the brain room and also use of AI within Industry 4.0 will be of key importance for the future development uh, in the, of the Czech Republic. And this is a topic that uh, we have uh, discussed several times with Karel Havlicek, who is the Vice President of the Chamber of Deputies of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. The floor is yours. Dear Mr. Minister, Vice President of the European Parliament, dear guests, I do not want to turn the Digital Czech Republic into just a set of statements and sentences. We all uh, agree that it is an important tool and that the implementation of this tool uh, will move us forward, but we cannot buy anything just uh, for these words. We need to move forward, and it doesn't mean that we will use subsidies and we will force everybody to digitize, but we need to create innovative environment, and then naturally companies, businesses, SMEs, large companies, and also institutions will digitalize and introduce new technologies. To create an innovative environment, this is easy to say, but another thing is uh, to set up certain parameters. Perhaps you will remember our innovation strategy when we actually interconnected science, universities, businesses. They all went in the same direction and started uh, believing that if we innovate and if we take the right approach, and if there are no major differences between businesses and institutions, then we will be able to create those values. It's a natural process, and we want companies to expert, export, and uh, we want to invest into advanced technologies. We need to support such investments in order to become a base uh, for international teams in the area of science, advanced technologies. And we should also respect the wishes of the scientists uh, and also uh, support businesses. Uh, and uh, everything we do uh, must be measured. That's why we actually changed the system of funding of research and development and also assessment. And that's why we are becoming successful 
because the concept uh, of uh, the Digital Czech Republic is part of uh, the innovation strategy, and this is the concept that was prepared by Mr. Zurela. And we have actually moved forward, and we are among uh, top 11 uh, countries in the innovation strategy. So let's motivate businesses, and they will naturally invest into new technologies and tools. We can also do uh, what uh, Dita Haranzova has said, and that is to motivate workers to actually educate themselves, and uh, we shouldn't uh, overdo it. Um, well, because uh, there is lack of workforce also in other areas, but let's motivate also children. And I'm not meaning anything strategic. Uh, well, again, we, for example, introduced uh, a subject, uh, a human being and technology. So children are motivated since young age, and perhaps they will like working with new technologies, and later they might decide to study this specialization. When we talk about the government, it's uh, perhaps more difficult. Uh, we shouldn't only talk about uh, spending funds uh, from uh, a strategy or a plan. I always try to uh, persuade my colleagues uh, by saying, look at it from the perspective uh, for whom it is intended. That's why we did the digital uh, vignette uh, and many other digitalized um, topics for the users. Now there will be a huge uh, challenge um, at the Ministry for Regional Development as they will digitalize the whole building industry and not because of it will not be done for the sake of digitalization but because it is useful for the users and if we look at it from this perspective then we can become a leader and it will be a natural process thank you very much and i look forward to the discussion thank you very much <coughs> this was the last speaker, keynote speaker, and we are opening the uh, first panel of today. Pardon. Jako slon v porcelánu. Tady tou malou Čeplinovskou with this little comedy, I'm introducing our first panel today. The topic is the Czech Republic on the way from the assembly plant to the brain room. I'm welcoming Ivan Bartos, Deputy Prime Minister for Digitalization of the Czech Republic, Karel Havlíček, Vice President of the Chamber of Deputies of the Parliament, Vladimir Dlouhý, President of the Chamber of Commerce of the Czech Republic, and Jan Švena, Chairman of the Executive and Supervisor Committee of uh, Search EI and Director of the ADIA Think Tank uh, and uh, Center for Global Economic Policy at Columbia University. It will, the panel will be moderated by Andrzej Holska, uh, editor of the Hospodářské noviny Daily. We are talking about the digital transformation of the economy, which can move the Czech Republic among the most successful countries in the world. Uh, this will be, however, uh, conditioned by close collaboration between the public and private sector and also major investments into innovation. Thank you very much. I hope you are going to enjoy this panel. My name is Andrzej Holska, and I'm opening a panel on the, Czech, uh, on the topic of the Czech Republic on the way from the assembly plant to the brain room and uh, the topic is basically digital transformation of the economy. Let us now discuss what has been functioning well, what has been functioning less uh, good, and uh, how this will uh, impact the Czech economy, including uh, the happenings, the COVID situation, and uh, the 
war in Ukraine. I would start with an analysis by Deloitte, which was published back in 2019, um, which said the Czech Republic has remained rather an assembly plant. We are based on, not based on the qualified uh, labor force. And the analysis says that any change will require uh, a change in perception of the uh, incentives. And the second important step was major improvement in the education system. The analysis stated that whenever a foreign investor seeks a highly qualified labor force, they will go elsewhere than in the Czech Republic. So, gentlemen, would you agree with this analysis and would you agree with these two major steps or which other steps do you see that are required to make uh, the Czech Republic uh, an innovation promoter? Thank you very much for the floor. Welcome once again. I very much enjoy the title of this panel, particularly in Czech, it sounds well. It was actually one of the political claims in, uh, uh, in our campaign, but it has been in place for quite long, much longer than we uh, started our campaign. Uh, so I do agree. I looked into later data, uh, which looks into the proportion of IT experts among the labor force and uh, female uh, uh, employment. And we rank 15th in the EU in these uh, aspects. Uh, but we need to be aware that uh, the change in uh, the education system represents a cycle. Uh, the uh, deputy chairman mentioned uh, the change uh, at uh, elementary schools, but this will only result in a well-qualified and educated adult person in some 20 years. And if we want to use the human resources as one of the pillars, uh, of the digital transformation, we need to be faster. And if you look into the large companies, uh, IT companies, whether Microsoft or Google or other, I think that the major uh, importance should be given to what I call the upskill, that is uh, on ongoing and lifelong education of existing labor force and also providing incentives uh, to uh, activities that uh, promote rather people than technology. It's not difficult to spend an enormous amount of money for technology, but investment into the human resources is more important. It will help to upskill your staff, your labor force. It will open up the market to foreign experts. I remember some 20 years ago when I worked uh, as an IT uh, staff uh, for uh, an American company. Uh, Prague was uh, very popular with IT people from America because they enjoyed very much their life uh, in uh, Prague. And today, I don't see the same situation. I don't feel it. Prague is so attractive any longer. So we would like to perhaps restart this and open up again the Czech Republic to be attractive for the foreign experts to work in Prague and elsewhere in the Czech Republic. Because obviously, in the many countries where the digitalization is further, there has been a contribution from foreigners. I do not uh, like the word assembly plant. What what do you mean exactly by that? And often uh, 
we underestimate ourselves. Um, we are no longer an assembly plant because uh, uh, the market uh, changed the situation. Yes, 20 years ago, we had an extremely cheap labor, uh, but it is no longer the case. And if we are or are not an assembly plant, it's not decided in the offices of uh, political, of politicians or agencies, but by investors. Uh, and they either invest or they do not invest. And if you look at US-based companies present here, and I was in close cooperation uh, with them, and we communicated closely. I have to say that uh, the fact that we have scaled labor, technical labor, reasonable priced um, labor force, quite good environment, uh, cooperation with the university, were the reasons why they invested huge money and why they create value added. Whether we are an assembly plant or not, uh, it is decided uh, by those who actually buy products of our companies. Uh, if our products would be um, of bad quality, uh, then no one would buy it. Uh, I do agree that we produce a lot of, um, of the so-called semi-products, so they are further improved elsewhere. But the state needs to motivate for this environment to be created here. As for investment incentives, that's the past. That was actually the first act that I brought uh, into the Chamber of Deputies, the change uh, or amendment to this piece of legislation. So only those companies create value added will receive an incentive, although it is quite difficult to define what is value added. And we actually used uh, the um, skills of uh, the staff uh, as uh, one of the criterion. So we are not in a bad position, no. But let's motivate others to improve the value added. And let's motivate children uh, to focus on technical fields. Uh, we are in uh, the first league, not in the second league in uh, Europe. But uh, there is also an extra league above the first league. That's my comment. Um, also, I want to uh, mention to all the participants that you can uh, use Slido and ask questions um, uh, to our panelists. So please uh, scan the code on your uh, badges and you can ask questions. So uh, now representatives of the business and then academia. So what to do? Um, uh, Karel Havlicek uh, said that the Czech Republic is somewhere in the middle of those uh, value chains. That's uh, a well-known fact. Uh, Aren't we actually destined to that? Uh, perhaps it's illusion that we want to play the top league. Uh, we are a neighboring country of Germany, and we will be always integrated into their uh, value chains. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I will stick to answering your question, whether from the assembly plant to high value added. Well, I do not like this word or uh, assembly plant. After um, 2000, uh, we actually attracted uh, investments in this area. Um, we say, and we've been saying that for a long time, well, for me, it's higher added. Uh, value domestic that will improve our competitiveness on the global markets. Uh, by well, answering your question, better s uh, motivation and better education, definitely yes. But the devil is in the details. We need to put aside those cliches and start discussing what specifically needs to be done. Before I say what specifically needs to be done, I will uh, comment uh, on your comment. Generally speaking, we should pursue economic policy that uh, corresponds to our capabilities, 
um, to our education, to our historical development, uh, and to what we have already invested. But there is an exception, and the exception is the area that we are talking about. I remember it was, uh, I think, um, Vice uh, Prime Minister remembering the 1990s, and I can remember actually 1970s. When I talked to people from IBM, they told me that in early 1980s, the Czech software guys from Czechoslovakia were better than others in Central Europe, all the way to Dusseldorf. So we could build on what was created in the late 80s and 1990s. And uh, I believe that this is the area where, um, from the point of view, what we have achieved, and from the point of view of human capital, from the point of view what we have invested in, digital economy is starting catching up with the automotive industry in terms of uh, share in GDP. I have an analysis of uh, Google for startups, and I'm not sure whether I can quote it. That's uh, from October 2021, and it shows that the Czech Republic has a good competitive advantage. So I would go in this direction. So briefly, uh, what to do uh, to go from those slogans and cliches to specific things. First uh, is uh, regulative and uh, legislative support. Uh, Dita mentioned that improved access to banking finances and also attracting private uh, capital, local, foreign, venture capital funds, etc. Improving conditions for businesses of this type so that the companies as mentioned during the discussion on the 1st of January at the Chamber of Commerce, we heard specific examples. Young companies uh, better go to Frankfurt because it takes four weeks to uh, found a company, and here it takes half a year. So support of SMEs as well. Major change in the Czech education system. How? Uh, well, to strengthen the um, demand on the labor market by rescaling and upskilling. Uh, also, supporting investment into R&D and science, uh, supporting trade relations, active support of uh, cooperation with uh, digitally advanced countries. That will be ever more important uh, after the crisis uh, um, of the Ukraine of the war in Ukraine, we just cannot uh, allow for islands to be created, and we have to push forward for European-wide cooperation. And uh, as I am uh, representing here private business, perhaps it's not uh, an issue for me, but the government should invest in digitalization and speeding up uh, the whole e-government process. And two major areas are education and also support of private capital. Without that, we will not move forward. We, and we need to speed up all the processes that should allow for better uh, business environment so that companies stay here and if um, uh, if they even sell their company they should stay here and also pay taxes here thank you Jan Schweiner also thank for the invitation I think that all of the ideas that we have heard are really worthy. I think we should focus on one another important thing. Uh, we need to understand how the market is uh, developing restructuring and what, it, uh, what success actually means. It was possible in the past to be average and still make good money. But today we see major differences that the countries that are well off are much, much better off than the others. So the progress that we will try to make is important. 
back in the 80s and nine, early 90s when the internet was developing and uh, the starts were quite slow, we saw that the United States invested into the internet development more than Europe and it cost Europe dear because it was then much more difficult to catch up with the top uh, promoters and uh, top investors. So we need to promote these startups that we currently have within our territories uh, to stay here and not to be overwhelmed by investors from overseas. So it is a lesson to be learned. Another lesson is that even prior to 2000, Europe stated in Lisbon to become the most advanced uh, region in the world within 10 years. And uh, then in 28, 29, uh, we realized that we can't make it. So we pushed the deadline to 2020. We are still not there. So again, the lesson is that it is always good to have a strategy, to have a target but then you need to implement it. For us in the Czech Republic, since we do not have uh, any uh, raw materials, uh, we need to rely on the human capital. So the, the emphasis should be on high quality education at all levels, obviously, but especially the tertiary education. We should not be uh, happy and satisfied with uh, all our schools ranking 400 or 600 in the world, uh, while China is within the top 100. So the emphasis on high quality education is vital. And the other aspect is business environment. The capital will always find its way to the environment that is friendly, uh, accessible. And if we have this, the investment will come. We do have investment, foreign investment, but we could have much more. So if we put emphasis on these two aspects, it will help. And perhaps a couple more minor comments. Um, we sometimes think that we are handicapped by being at the tail of the production process. This doesn't make uh, any importance. The important thing is to be in the position where the added value is generated, whether it is at the start or at the tail of the process. Uh, another uh, point, where our competitive advantage is it? Obviously, countries do generate their, co their comparative advantages over the history. And if we are able to make the education and the business environment uh, our competitive advantage, uh, we will have it. The collaboration and coordination between the business and academia uh, is extremely important. It is obvious from other countries where it works. It was uh, the, the example of internet can be used again very well. It was originally developed as a government project, then it was taken over by the academia, by universities, and the business took it over eventually. It was a natural way, it was a natural progress because the system is so structured that this progress and route was quite natural. So this is also something that we might uh, use and implement. And uh, yet another aspect is a certain deglobalization. I believe that this will happen to a certain extent. Components may be uh, manufactured closer to 
the uh, key production. But in digitalization, the globalization will expand on the contrary. Thank you. Vladimir Dlouhi uh, wants to contribute. You are not enjoying it. You want to make it even livelier. Well, I do enjoy it, in particular in the past couple of weeks. No, no, there are no comments. No, 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 no. Uh, I just want to pick up um, at what uh, Jan Schweiner has said, uh, competitive advantage. I am not sure whether it was Wayne Gretzky or Mario Lemieux who said that uh, the foundation of the success in life was not being where the pack was, but uh, being where the puck was actually heading, the pack was heading. So it is a huge competitive advantage that we have, and that is in human capital. And we have to direct the government policy and to stimulate capital. We also talked about some uh, taxation, um, uh, and uh, there was not uh, a unanimous opinion within the digital community. We just need to have and forward our activities to where the largest demand is going to be. And the pandemic and other trends show us where the future demand is going to be. And that should be our focus, uh, where the back is going to be in the future. And I think that we have uh, Gretzky's uh, here. Yes, not in ice hockey, uh, but uh, in other fields, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I have mentioned, you can ask your question using Slido. Uh, so we will use them. The first one is for Deputy Prime Minister Bartosz. You said that the Czech Republic should attract foreign experts. Do you have any specific plans, such as special visas for IT experts, such as the case in the US? Uh, because of my life experience, and I worked uh, for U.S. company that is, I think, still based in Prague. I actually talked about uh, the representatives of the U.S. embassy, and we will have a project because uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, our priority is uh, transatlantic ties. That was perhaps not as strong during the Trump administration. Now we hosted the nine plus meeting. Uh, so um, the most advanced companies uh, and politicians and uh, the links uh, in the technology area between the Czech Republic and U.S. and healing some of the wounds um, uh, is also important. And whether we have uh, specific plans, uh, we cooperate with the Czech uh, project, and we know that many refugees from Ukraine uh, are here and uh, please do not work with stereotypes. Automatically, they will not become uh, workers in the construction industry or cleaning ladies. So we are actually working on a project for upskilling and reskilling of Ukrainian women. And um, uh, the Ministry of Industry and Trade has a campaign, and Dita Formankova is involved. So let's uh, look for IT brains also in the refugees coming to our country. It's important if we have a company based here, and we sometimes uh, uh, import IT experts uh, from uh, non-EU countries and they actually then work here as unskilled work workers. Um, so just to add uh, to what uh, Mr. Lohi has said, 
there are many factors. And for example, founding a company uh, within a single day, you know, when you have this brilliant idea and you want to have a patent and you want to start your business. Um, it's important, but also the legislation in the natural lifespan of the company uh, to have a stable and predictable environment and then the life cycle of companies. And there are many companies that actually grew up then they were sold abroad. But we do not have sort of hundreds of gems uh, that would uh, grow up uh, from a garage company to a company that is able uh, to uh, work on global markets. So we need to support this uh, life cycle by legislation and also taxation, uh, perhaps uh, simplifying taxes um, in certain areas to simplify the whole life cycle of uh, companies. For example, aerospace technology. And um, let's be grateful for uh, any competence center, because this is uh, where the excellence then uh, is at the universities. And it's uh, not uh, about the digitization, but about the environment. Yes, the environment is of key importance. Uh, we always uh, uh, sort of looked uh, at uh, uh, what was the Czech Republic's rent ranking in the doing business um, uh, uh, ranking by the World Bank, it's no longer to be existing, but uh, that's okay. Yes, it's uh, actually not um, about how quickly you can uh, found a company. You can actually do it quite quickly uh, using a, a public notary. Uh, you can do it really quickly within a couple of uh, days uh, and what is important is to motivate people to go into startup centers, incubators, and we have quite a lot of them. Uh, Czech Invest did a great job uh, historically. We have uh, lots of them. And it's not a question uh, of legislation, but approach to management and perhaps assessment of uh, incubators. I actually went to uh, many incubators in the US, in Florida, New York, etc. And what I like about them is that uh, the bosses of these incubators are not proud of the number of companies. They look at figures, return on equity. So how many uh, investors, uh, what was the future fate of the company, how many jobs they offered, uh, what were the results uh, once they left uh, the incubators. And that's what the rating of incubator is based on. And also the fees are based on the ranking. It shouldn't be for free. And we shouldn't be only proud of the number of companies, but uh, the number of companies that are still existing and attracting capital. And I had one idea that we didn't manage to implement is that the incubators in the Czech Republic will be also rated. Universities should be also rated. We changed that and universities were against that. Uh, in R&D, uh, they are being ranked, and we know which universities are the best ones, and which are average, and which are below average. And we should also take the same approach uh, with respect to incubators. And they should know that incubator in Olomouc, in Budějovice, etc., etc., managed to generate many skilled people who attracted investors, because that's the business card of the quality of incubators. So quality, not quantity. That's the US model. And if we use it, that's the right way. We have another question, which follows upon what Ivan Bartos said. How can digital transformation be impacted by the current uh, refugee crisis uh, in the aftermath of the uh, conflict in uh, Ukraine? Vladimir Dlohi, you're representing uh, many companies. Back in 2015, uh, there was this large uh, 
uh, refugee crisis and some representative of either BMW or Mercedes uh, announced that the influx of refugees would initiate a uh, economic miracle in Germany. Obviously, this has not happened. Over one half of the refugees who remained in Germany uh, indeed are uh, employed, but rather on the uh, unqualified manual positions. So from your viewpoint, uh, the refugee wave from the Ukraine, considering that a major part of these refugees might stay in the Czech Republic. Do you see it as an opportunity for the business? Well, when you ask uh, me this question, I first realize how horrible the comments by some of our MPs are in the parliament. Uh, they are playing the anti-migration note uh, in the parliament. But generally speaking, all studies, uh, whether published by uh, American or other international uh, institutions, represent or res all refugee waves indeed resulted in economic progress, but not at the moment, but one generation later, whether it was uh, a Mexican uh, wave of refugees to the US or elsewhere. Uh, at the moment, we are talking about uh, the short term horizon of five, maximum 10 years. So I don't think really that this particular refugee wave from the Ukraine considering also their uh, age, gender, uh, social structure would be a major contribution. And uh, also from the humanitarian point of view, we should be striving for ending the conflict and helping them uh, return back home. I have been uh, supporting several families who stay in uh, one of the cloisters in Prague. And when I visit them, all of them wish to return home. Of course, the older the people, the more they wish to go home. So once again, the answer to your question uh, is that I don't see this rather as an immediate uh, contribution to the economic growth. But um, in this country, we have been very um, uh, cautious in uh, providing and in granting long-term uh, work visa. It's extremely difficult to get uh, an American expert of Indian origin uh, and providing him visa to work in the Czech Republic. We have had similar cases in the past. And this is also where the Czech uh, Republic and the government should become much more flexible. And if I may, I would also like to answer uh, the question why the act on uh, universities uh, is not changed or has not been changed. And my answer is short. The Ministry of Education is the most rigid, and most uh, old fashioned uh, ministry in the country. You also promoted uh, work of uh, international foreign experts in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have heard uh, in the past uh, comparison between Poland and Czech Republic from Ukrainian uh, job seekers. I believe that even in the current refugee wave, there is a certain potential. I believe uh, that our project uh, IT for Ukrainian women may be uh, successful. 
because this type of uh, qualification courses works among, among general public. Um, when we look back at the 2015 refugee crisis and the dense situation, uh, it may have generated certain apprehension or even paranoia uh, towards people of different ethnicity, for example. Uh, so this is something that definitely needs uh, a change of mindset. And there are many other taboos present in this respect. There are numbers of professions, for example, in medicine, where there is an enormous lack of labor force. And a number of foreign doctors have worked at universities, and we do have many foreigners working at universities, for example. However, uh, many of our professional organizations have defined quite uh, strict barriers to entering the market. For many professions, you actually don't really need to know the language, the local language, to such a good extent. Let's take a radiologist who only interprets the images and, of course, talks to partners, professionals. Let us be more open uh, in that respect. I wonder whether uh, Professor Schweiner will react and respond. I think it is a matter of much more flexible education on all levels, not only tertiary, but also secondary and elementary. And I'm not talking really about uh, little kids where you really need uh, teachers who have certain uh, pedagogical uh, training. But uh, for me, the best teachers have always been those that were uh, very uh, empathetic and who were simply advocating their, uh, their topic and who were attracting the people. So a person who has been successful in their uh, business, in their field, can be much more attractive than a qualified teacher. Uh, I have uh, and inside to some analysis uh, from the secondary schools, uh, and it's not really uh, very positive. There are only three people in each class who want uh, to go into innovation business. In any academic or other environment, uh, it is important to, to support and promote those people who are creative and, and uh, to be uh, inviting and helping such people because they will bring that into their business life. Uh, let me also go back to the better quality of uh, university education. I believe that a major reform is needed. We have um, a system of uh, self-government of the universities and um, if they have not been able to uh, develop and grow in the way and up to the level that we would like to see then there is a change required because of course there, there has to be then uh, a push from the outside it should really work on the managerial uh, level in the managerial context. Unless you have and present results, you won't be successful. You won't be uh, receiving money. So 
in this sense, there has to be an external force that will motivate the inside uh, self-government. And of course, the self-government should have the freedom to collaborate with businesses and other institutions from outside. I would ask both politicians and all of you here, perhaps, uh, because uh, it's not quite clear to me. What was the miracle that we, together with Romania, Estonia, and I have uh, figures here, so how come there was the miracle that we have a comparative advantage in human capital, um, also compared to Western Europe, uh, with the exception of uh, Portugal? Why Portugal, Romania, Czech Republic, partially Poland, and Estonia, in the whole 27 uh, EU members plus uh, UK. Why do we have comparative advantage if we have uh, not quality education? Uh, perhaps it's not uh, about founding a business, but attracting investors. Uh, uh, skilled people actually leave, uh, companies leave. Uh, how come there is this miracle? What actually made us uh, to be able to have this uh, advantage? Well, if our universities are not able to provide proper education, then companies such as Google have their own uh, training courses. Uh, it's not six semesters, 12 semesters, um, bachelor or master's. They have their own uh, um, lifelong uh, trainings, uh, two semesters, quite focused uh, on what they need for their business. This uh, should be the way. It's a totally different model than what we have uh, when talking about university education. So uh, how come we have the miracle? Perhaps we should use that. That was uh, a challenge for Mr. Havlicek. Well, I'm not sure whether it's uh, a miracle. Perhaps it's an objective fact. I do not believe in miracles. I'll go back to what I have said. Uh, sometimes we uh, say everything is bad, bad. But if you look at the data, we export well. And uh, we have people who actually studied here. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, the Czech universities are best. And, and I'm not talking about uh, politics. Uh, the environment in this country is not bad. The results of the Czech Republic of uh, businesses and people are not bad. But it doesn't mean that we should be happy and satisfied and not do anything. Let's uh, not be afraid of showing ranking, say, who is uh, the best, who is average, who is under the average. Uh, if we let it be, and of course universities wouldn't want to have the ranking because uh, they will uh, do not want to see uh, themselves being uh, ranked as average. And for them, uh, they will be uh, actually um, frustrated and it might then become uh, frustration and demotivation. Yes, uh, I can uh, uh, lose, but then I can, uh, you know, work and become better. And we need to show the best, but also uh, show uh, the worst. And then we need to change uh, the management. And then it's about the Universities Act. Yes, it's rigid. We want to change it, but it's not that easy. So these are some obstacles that could be overcome. But the philosophy and the way of thinking, that's um, quite tricky. And that actually forces us into the average. We are afraid of uh, the ranking results. Uh, Ivan Bartos and then Mr. Schweiner. Yes, I do agree that we should not talk bad about ourselves. We have the brains here. But um, uh, we 
also have to be aware of uh, the risk because we know that uh, uh, everything is excellent. Actually, we see the questions and perhaps we uh, respond to questions as well and you can't see them. Um, where the system is going to be in five years? Well, let's uh, look uh, at the speed of decision made by courts. Uh, you know, uh, why would you risk it uh, if it takes so long? Uh, then you go to the UK or any other uh, country. So uh, we need to focus on the whole ecosystem. I have experience from academia and I often, uh, well, there are excellent professors who actually scolded me that I actually went into the uh, on the road of madness well the academia often refers to what has been uh, accepted and proven that's the opinion of capacities then you have uh, five percent of innovation and so that the uh, academia accept you. These are all those citation indexes. You need to be published in magazines. Uh, for example, my sister does it. I know it's so difficult to come up with something innovative, even in uh, industrial field. And the world of innovation works differently. I go to a place where no one uh, has ever been to you present something that no one has ever seen and then somebody tells yeah this is an idea worth investing in this is an idea that will change something that could be sold uh, worldwide and we need to use this mentality also google has its legacy employees and they work there for 20 years and they have to train them because uh, it's not only about the search engine it's about cloud systems and every single company needs to keep training their employees otherwise they would leave because what they have learned 20 years ago is irrelevant for new technologies so it's the tertiary education life le long learning that could be the key that's what i wanted to say and also that uh, the world of academia is often rigid. Yes, it is true, but it's uh, true not only in the Czech Republic. And I believe that uh, this world will open up uh, because the needs of the world are changing and many people in the academia also went uh, beyond the borders, uh, what was uh, actually imaginable um, several years ago. Uh, because such people have the potential to uh, change uh, the world, uh, whether we talk about blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, or whatever, in uh, five years. Jan Schweiner, I would like to add to what Mr. Havlicek has said. Yes, I agree that it's important to focus on results. But also, it is uh, important uh, to um, channel the funds to where uh, there are good results. And the centers that are excellent should receive more funds, etc. And we can't see that. Uh, we see a huge rigidity in uh, the allocation of sources, and it's difficult to change it. It has changed a bit um, with the 17 plus methodology. Um, well, uh, those who are better will receive more. Uh, the average will receive the same, and below average will receive less. And that's also a motivation because, uh, you know, uh, those people who receive less uh, are getting angry, and that motivates them. So we have uh, the method. Uh, that uh, actually uh, is used. Uh, Sergem at the universe at the Ch at Charles University was uh, ranked as uh, best, and they received uh, uh, less funds uh, than others. So in real life, the situation is totally different. Ivan Bartosz mentioned one quite obvious thing, uh, and that is that 
one thing is coming up with an innovation that's brand new, but on the other hand, you also need someone who's going to invest into the implementation. And one of the questions relates to that uh, establishing a company fast is possible even here, but entering, having an investor entering the company is much more difficult. That's one of the reasons why companies are established uh, outside. Well, I don't see any major barriers to, to having international or foreign investors. Uh, I worked in a, the business myself and we had several investors unless the uh, investor comes from a toxic country. Of course, there is this screening of investors. I have some data uh, on me and I have a chart which indicates the relation between the uh, size of the startup company at the start, at the beginning of its operation, and uh, whether they then stayed in the country or not. So in our region, Ukraine is worst, Poland is best. The Czech Republic is somewhere in between. Over the uh, last three, four years, this situation has been improving in the Czech Republic, so more and more companies stay in the Czech Republic. In any case, the best valued startups between 20, uh, 2000 and 2020 is the UiPath, which currently is uh, operating from the US. and. In the Czech Republic, uh, JetBrains uh, is the best valued in the Czech Republic. Uh, they stayed in the Czech Republic, but it is actually a company um, established by Russians. And otherwise, there is no Czech company uh, in the top uh, rank. If we look at the overall valuation of uh, the businesses, the Czech Republic has uh, the largest proportion of the three top companies, which is Rohlik, JetBrains, and Kivicom, and they actually represent 90% of the value of the startups. While in other countries, like in Poland, of course, we have the unicorns too, the leaders, but there are many more other prime companies who grow significantly as well. So this is again something that we would try, we should try uh, to promote. So not to have just one, two, three top companies, but have an entire ecosystem uh, available. And this brings us back to good qualification, education, good business environment, good conditions for international venture and other capital. If you look at the positive examples from abroad, um, you would hardly believe that France could be a really model where the uh, proportion um, of highly valued startups is much higher than in Germany, for example. They are much better uh, off than uh, the UK. So you wouldn't have thought uh, that uh, France is uh, highly innovative, but it really is. We have another question, and the question is, everyone talks about uh, high quality education as one of the pillars of digitalization. So where should it start? Does it mean purchasing iPads to students at secondary school? So where should this improvement start? Karel Havlicek. Uh, I've already mentioned the uh, school subject uh, man and technology, and uh, it should include practical exercises, practical use of all kinds of technologies. And after many years, this has been introduced to the curricula uh, of some 60 schools for the moment. Uh, hopefully, this will become a mandatory subject uh, soon. I'm not saying this is the only and the best way, but 
I think it's very practical and useful because you can show it in practice to the, to the students and if they are attracted to it, it might um, then uh, instigate also their further interest. What I would also recommend uh, is uh, to introduce much more practical cooperation with uh, between schools and the practical businesses. At universities, we have heard uh, that uh, several times already. You cannot uh, give rules what the school should do or should not, uh, or impose any rules. But we should push for uh, improvement through a more flexible system of accreditation. If a university or a tertiary education institution uh, wants to accreditate a new uh, field, it's extremely difficult. Uh, it has there are very many special requirements. Even if you want to involve uh, foreign experts, it's extremely difficult. So where to start? I think um, almost everything has been said. Well, actually, when you gradu graduate from a teaching university, you have. Uh, excellent knowledge in the information society. Perhaps you have a potential to teach IT. And the attractiveness of this profession and the salary and the security is so non-attractive that such a person would go to work as a Java expert uh, with a double salary. Also, when we talk about university uh, teachers, those who actually share the knowledge, all sorts of not only professors, but many other positions. There are my friends who are almost 50, and I am 42. They, you know, still teach at the university and they have 20 years old students because uh, they are single and they do not care about money much. But the attractiveness of this profession um, of sharing is not there and it's really sad. The money in that are of key importance. When you graduate, uh, you have your life partner, you want to have a family. It's not uh, perhaps the best uh, to marry a teacher, but my mom was a teacher at a secondary school. So it's one of the issues. And then another aspect, the society is developing faster than uh, the institutions manage to respond. And when we talk about the information society, it's, it's actually over. We are already in the knowledge society, not information society. Information, disinformation, technologies, uh, there are plenty of them everywhere. And all the people use smartphones, internet banking, um, and they, you know, have Facebook account. But what about that? And now I sort of, um, I, I say that the primary research is important, but uh, for every single person, uh, what is important is the applied research. So we want the people uh, to be able to face life challenges, and that's uh, perhaps uh, the change of mindset. It's not only about the curriculum, it's about the people. So involve also personalities in this digitally attractive education. You know, there are personalities and they actually um, have presentations at the Chamber of Commerce and, and there are excellent uh, examples and lead by example is the biggest motivation uh, for the young generation uh, to, to have the reason to go for it. I would like to add two more important points. 
universities uh, are getting um, of, uh, higher quality because of um, competitors. Um, universities compete for professors and it works well in the industry and in services uh, where the businesses face um, competition but universities do not face competition. You know, th there is um, nothing like that. They receive money centrally. They do not have to compete for funds. So let's imagine uh, we'll do it differently. Uh, let's not uh, pay uh, the universities, but let's give money to people and they can actually use them for studying at any university in the world. And that would change um, uh, the settings and people would actually go elsewhere and particularly if uh, they know languages, then the competition would be huge and uh, only those who are able uh, would survive. The second point is uh, what's interesting and what we see in particularly in the US, that businesses give grants and contributions to universities and we can't see it here much. And they then, the businesses in the US then work with the students uh, and there is uh, this cooperation. Um, how come the Czech businesses actually uh, want to receive money, not give money? Vladimir Dlouhy would want to respond. I wanted to say uh, or, or something that Jan Schweinar has already said. Uh, so uh, the second point, many US universities actually, uh, actually receive money from businesses and thus uh, influence the curricula in these universities. If you want to introduce that, uh, just give money to people and people could choose university, then half of the rectors uh, would uh, chain themselves to St. Vincent's uh, statue to not allow that. Uh, well, uh, we sometimes fight with the Ministry of Education in certain areas and and the world of universities and uh, ministries is really too uh, rigid and unless uh, we do something about it and it needs time, it uh, uh, will be something that will slow us down. And what I want to say now that um, um, Deputy Prime Minister Bartosz has said something of great in of great importance that the society develops much faster than uh, what the institutions uh, do. And it's about this idea where the pack is going to be in five years' time. And perhaps uh, it's not uh, about education, also the primary and secondary education so that the children are ready for digitization but uh, because they all have uh, iPad uh, when they are four years old, uh, they are ready for that. But we need to also link the schools and the business sector, for example, for businesses by buying curricula for money or businesses having their own two semester, four semester training courses. It's about uh, people. Um, you know, although the environment was not the best, but we have experienced this intellectual miracle. It's about the whole atmosphere in the society uh, where we will go. And, um, uh, you know, saying winner, who is winners and who is the loser, or whether it will be e-commerce or artificial intelligence, and we will spend lots of money at the level of the government. No, that's not the right way. Businesses need to focus on that. There needs to be the milieu that will generate it. I know that uh, liberal um, point of view on the world uh, is not popular, but that's my opinion. Uh, both gentlemen wanted to respond just briefly. Well, that's a wonderful sentence. Where the pack is going to be in five years, where to uh, stand and wait. Well, no one knows where the pack is going to be. Uh, we can uh, say it will be cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, but uh, uh, no one knows. But where should we uh, 
stand. Well, you should uh, know it. You are either capable and you will uh, be at the right place uh, and you will earn money or not. Uh, you uh, actually cannot ask uh, somebody else to tell you where to stand. You are developing your career. The state needs to develop some foundations to have knowledge and skills, but the state uh, cannot tell you uh, where to stand um, in five years' time. I have the estimate. It will all be here. Uh, well, mobile solutions, not portal solution. You know, uh, well, the knowledge as we are used to receiving it, although I guess I'm the youngest one, we sit uh, by uh, the computer, Sinclair, uh, Atari, uh, PCs, and now we all have the mobile phone, and, and it will be all there. You know, e-government uh, scanning and checking authenticity of uh, documents. Uh, you know, scanning uh, the documents, um, uh, for example, university diploma. So where will be in digitization? Well, so mobile thing, uh, mobile and thing, artificial intelligence. That's the way the world uh, is going. And we need to set up uh, good rules because the Black Mirror uh, series and the uh, critical um, uh, scenarios when you look into China are not actually, uh, the science fiction is not uh, that far away from reality. And, you know, being a student is great, and it's up to every single person. And if the university is not uh, offering it, it's offered by Impact Hub, and people see the talents. When I first went to the dormitory of the university and I saw what is the salary uh, for a specialist in, um, in uh, uh, water and, and chemistry, and you know, uh, the salary was uh, great because it was a highly specialized um, uh, field and uh, there were not many experts. And if you cannot find it uh, here or in the education system, well, there are no barriers for persons to engage in self-study uh, uh, without the help of the state. I think it's important for the state uh, not to put obstacles uh, for self-education. The organizers um, uh, told me to make sure uh, to keep uh, uh, the agenda. Uh, well, I do not have my watch, and uh, when I look at your watches, I can see a 15-minute difference, so I can see the time flies differently for the opposition and the uh, governing political party. No, 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 I have a, a watch with only a single uh, arm, uh, so you have to actually calculate it. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, the time is up, uh, and I would like to invite you for lunch. Thank you very much, and thank you also to all of you for asking questions. So thank you very much for your first wonderful panel. And you know what I wanted to tell you, that there is a lunch break. Enjoy it. Uh, there is everything starting from baguettes to wonderful Brazilian filtered uh, coffee. And then we'll meet again at 12.45. And we'll hear the VIP talk about progress and new challenges of the government. Enjoy the lunch.
fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. But to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work.
security, being fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. And to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work.
insecurity, being fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. And to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work.
Наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not gonna happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what NotPetya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. Ну, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, 10 часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also was, doesn't work. It was real shock for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. Cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting, and if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens.
and security, being fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. But to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. It was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not gonna happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what not Petya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. Ну, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, 10 часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also was, does it work. 
it was real shocked for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objective in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. The cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting. And if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens. that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work.
что наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not going to happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what not Petya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. Ну, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, 10 часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also was does it work. It was real shocked for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. The cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting. And if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens.
insecurity, being fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. And to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. Страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. A global cyber attack. We've never seen anything on this scale. It can travel from computer to computer. Hospitals paralyzed, computers had shut down. Wanna cry is different. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not going to happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry, it was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what not Petya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. We have TV station who have been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also were, uh, doesn't work. 
it was a real shock for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption to stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. Cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting. And if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens. that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work.
Я думаю, что наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled, and those are people who are worried about their appointment for an operation. It was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not going to happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Take you it's sophisticated in a series of attacks, Every taking control of computers computer. and demanding digital ransom. <laughs> the list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think yeah. what not Petya represents okay. is not just the okay. evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. Ну, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, 10 часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also was doesn't work. It was real shock for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. The cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organizations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting. And if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens.
fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. And to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, and now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. Ladies and gentlemen, the Flintstone on the screen means that we are starting the next session of the conference uh, Digital Czech Republic 2022. I hope that just like us here, you who watch us on stream have time to have your lunch. Just before lunch, we had a panel on the topic of the Czech Republic's way from the assembly plant to the brain room. And I would like to thank all the panelists, including the moderator, for launching the whole sequence of sessions. And uh, this whole conference uh, has been organized also with the help of our partners, that's Google and Microsoft whom I thank, and we are ready for the next session. Let me introduce the moderator of the VIP talk. That's myself, uh, but I'm not the key person. The key person is Zdeněk Zajíček, who is my honorable guest, uh, Vice President of the Czech Chamber of Commerce. So this is VIP talk on progress and new challenges of e-government. 
and the annotation is digitize, digitalization of public administration has been one of the government's top priorities and this year should be the year of major changes. So we are definitely going to face uh, many changes. But the question is how to perceive the collaboration between the private and public sector in order to make the uh, digitalization uh, working and achieve the e-government. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your invitation. And I very much appreciate that we have the opportunity to talk here, even though there is not enough time for that. So about cooperation, collaboration between public and private sector, what are the uh, benefits and what are the risks? For many years, I used to work for the government sector. Uh, then I moved uh, back to the business, then again to the government, and currently I'm back in the business. So at the moment, I can uh, give you a, an external perspective, a perspective of, a, of the business sector. So uh, when thinking about the major and significant changes that should occur, perhaps already in 2020, in terms of e-government, is what the private sector knows and can do, and what the government sector cannot do. So we should uh, exchange the and share the experience, and uh, the private sector could provide its knowledge and know-how to the public sector, and the public sector should provide its guarantee, sort of, and sponsorship. And one of these uh, aspects and uh, manifestations of such uh, uh, collaboration is banking identity. What the banks had to do themselves simply to allow their clients uh, to access the banks remotely Uh, has been implemented in the legislation. We said whatever is good for the banks is also good for the government. And this is basically what the legislation says. Through this legislation, we ensured that the banks will maintain their banking identities reliable and secure because, of course, they want to keep the trust of their clients and, of course, don't want their clients to leave elsewhere. So their care for the customers and clients is permanent. And all these benefits have been also transferred to the government, to the state, because the state accepted what the banks have developed. So using the bank identity, the citizen can access and approach services of the state and government. So this is an excellent example of collaboration between the public and private sectors, where something that was developed in highly competitive environment of the private sector can be implemented and successfully and efficiently used also in the public sector. And I think this model could be used repeatedly. I have many ideas where this could be used and applied. Uh, I promised to say what is on the table, and uh, this one of the fields is transport or vehicles. Most of you will probably have a private vehicle, and you know it has to be registered in order to uh, be allowed to drive and also you need to have insurance and now the question is why couldn't the vehicles be registered at the insurance companies when you register a new car or your new vehicle shouldn't it be enough to go to the insurance uh, company and register and insure the car at the same moment. 
once everything is digitalized, it could be simple and viable. I believe this is perfectly viable. Of course, it will again require legislative changes. It will require uh, political will. But if this succeeds, then we would once again take away one of the barriers that the citizen has to overcome when registering a vehicle. If I say that it has been on the table, uh, there is a team of the Ministry of uh, Transport with insurance companies uh, and the representatives of these stakeholders uh, currently identify all the pieces of legislation that would have to be changed, amended, but apparently it's not unfeasible. Uh, the private sector is inherently used to care for the client in order to either when acquire a new client or to maintain the existing client. Uh, the public sector should be doing the same, but obviously there is no immediate reward for the public sector when the client remains. Uh, the same that applies to the private sector also applies to the pro-client non-profit sector. So they work similarly. And that is why they are so much uh, client focused, uh, the more so in the private profit-making sector. So. This is uh, what I want to emphasize because the non-profit, pro-client oriented sector could be the source of innovation for the future. Thank you very much for your wonderful answer. Unfortunately, we do not have too much time, but I'll ask yet another question. And that is technologies um, where the state um, is lagging behind and uh, I mean blockchain and Bitcoin. We know about decentralized autonomous organizations or entities that will not be bound to any single state. So does the state should always match with the private sector one to one or could you use a certain synergy or uh, the, the role should be somehow separated. One thing will be done by the same and the other by private company. It's a, an easy question to conclude. Yes, uh, as always. It is a complex issue and a complex answer to a simple question. What the state should follow is whether it should regulate certain areas. And if not, then it is not desirable. And let's leave it up to the private sector offering services. And naturally, technology um, will drive innovations and new opportunities. And the form of providing a service, it is really up to the business. Although there are areas where either there is certain regulation today or there is a threat of um, an equal ac approach to clients and there is a reason for regulating this field, then the state should be proactive and regulated. And therefore, the state should um, go forward. And uh, in the case of technologies, perhaps uh, create something like a sandbox in order to test um, provision of services uh, using digital technologies. And it could lead to the situation when it is confirmed that no regulation is needed and that you could leave it uh, fully up to the private sector or you could reach a conclusion that regulation is needed. But paradoxically, you could reduce it because the technology is such as it leaves, audit trail, etc., etc. 
and offers other ways of supervision that uh, were not available to the client, such as taxi. In in the past, um, the taxi driver needed to know Prague um, in order to uh, know the shortest way uh, from point A to point B. But now it is um, actually the client uh, that can check it easily. Uh, so now the question is, should the state regulate it or not? That should be the approach. Or it could be an area that is not covered by regulation and there is an, uh, it should be regulated, but then it should be reasonable. So again, discussion with the private sector, how to set it so that the advantages of the technology and of the innovation are not uh, killed immediately by uh, over-regulation. Yes, the idea about sandboxes uh, is great and I really like it, so hopefully we will uh, see that more often. The next panel is uh, about my favorite topic, um, artificial intelligence, Bitcoin, Internet, etc. But if we look at AI, I and my colleagues uh, from the field see a huge potential in healthcare. But it's quite tricky because the private sector has uh, innovations, but it needs to go through the regulatory cycle. Can I ask you about your idea how the state and private sector in healthcare could cooperate better? Do you have any idea? or an example that you like that you want to talk about. I see that one of the things that are not um, well sort of covered in health care is uh, data sharing. It's a very sensitive issue, health records, uh, personal data, uh, family ties, uh, diagnosis, etc. It needs to be uh, covered and uh, it should be monitored. But we need to find key partners in healthcare that are naturally um, interested in um, moving forward, um, those who need to share data most. And those who should share it and who should be the driver, I think, are, are health insurance companies and huge healthcare providers. These are the biggest uh, stakeholders, so the money um, flows. So these are the key stakeholders. And uh, if, I, um, if I was to use an analogy from uh, the banking identity where conditions were actually made to create uh, a joint venture banking identity that is actually in contact with the private uh, world. So I feel that if the legislation allow establishing of a single ident uh, entity of uh, health insurance companies, the, the so-called clearing center for health information, it would be used by the state, uh, it would be for the benefit of the patients, but also all the other stakeholders, such as small or large uh, health care providers, that would be useful. And that would be the the right kick uh, to speed it up, and it would be, it would involve not only uh, state uh, health insurance companies but also private, and it would be great, ladies and gentlemen. That was Daniel Zajcik, vice president of the Czech Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you could see on the screen, there is another panel, Internet, Artificial Intelligence, Bitcoin, and what comes next. The Internet is undoubtedly one of the most important inventions in the history of mankind and has a significant influence on the shape of the contemporary world. For many, therefore, it is an inseparable part of our lives. I love this topic, but I am not here to talk. I am here to introduce the next panelist, Dita Charanzova, Vice President and Member of Parliament, European Parliament, Vladimir Zurela, Director of the National Agency for Communication and Information Technology, Andrzej. Uh, Vlček, uh, who, is, uh, who is joining us online, he is the CEO of Avast, and Alžběta Krausová, researcher 
uh, Department of Prey Law Institute of State and Law of the Czech Academy of Science of the Czech Republic. And Petr Ochko, Deputy Minister for Digitization and Innovation, uh, Ministry of Industry and Trade, uh, will moderate uh, this discussion. Uh, Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your introduction, and thank you very much for telling everybody that I love Monte Python. I am uh, pleased to moderate this panel with such wonderful speakers. Welcome. And I will say a couple of uh, words uh, to start with. I have uh, some slides ready, but I'll start uh, by introducing the speakers uh, in our panel called Internet, Artificial Intelligence, Bitcoin, and what comes next. So the panelists are Vice President and Member of Parliament, um, Dita Haranzova. Uh, she is one of the most active um, members uh, of the European Parliament. She is interested in digital files, and one of her uh, successes is in her UCOL and uh, many other topics. So we are happy to have you with us. Then we have uh, Alžbeta Krausová, who is a wonderful researcher uh, from the Institute of State and Law of the Czech Academy of Sciences. She participates in many uh, projects uh, related to artificial intelligence, uh, responsibility of AI, ethical issues, regulations, and uh, thanks to her activities, she is also part of various uh, advisory bodies um, with uh, the European Commission or OECD. Uh, Mr. Vladimir Zurela, I think no need to introduce him uh, as he is a regular participant in this uh, conference, who is the director of the National Agency for Communication and Information Technology. And he knows well uh, digitization and IT. And last but not least, Andrzej Vlček. I think there is no need uh, to introduce him in detail. Unfortunately, he is only online with us. He is the CEO of Avast Software. There is, I guess, no need to uh, introduce it. It's one of the Czech unicorn sold to other hands, but he is one of the most successful Czech companies and players in the area of uh, antivirus software. And it is a company uh, that invests a lot in AI and other cloud solutions. So that was brief introduction of the speakers. And I will pass the floor on to them shortly. I would just uh, briefly say what are we going to discuss. One of the topics cutting across the developments uh, on all levels is working with data, namely big data. As you can see on the slide, the volume of data generated and stored in the online environment is continuously growing. By 2025, the volume should 
become five times greater compared to 2020. And the volume should be 175 zettabytes. That's a figure with 21 zeros at the end. The volume is growing continuously and obviously also the, the speed of the growth is accelerating. You may know that before 2003 or until 2003, the humankind generated 18 exabytes of data, which is a figure with 18 zeros at the end. Today, five exabytes are generated in less than two days. Uh, big data are used or processed using uh, AI algorithms. Not all applications that use the big data, of course, must be necessarily uh, useful and beneficial for the people. And of course, with this comes the question of data security and protection. Data mean enormous potential for economic growth. If we can find a way for efficient use of data, which is certainly a follow-up to what was mentioned previously about uh, healthcare, for example. Uh, so if we are able to efficiently use the data, uh, some 120 billion euro could be uh, saved in costs. This would apply to insurance, healthcare, transport, and many other areas. So we all understand that data represent enormous potential. And with the idea of their efficient use, the European Commission uh, launched what I call the digital uh, legislative offensive. So first, uh, well, the, these were the strategic documents. Uh, which gradually are being turned into legislation. Those that are of major importance to us apply to digital data use and to artificial intelligence. There is a whole range of legislative proposals. The question, of course, is whether they all are rightly oriented and directed. I'm not saying they are not, but it is always good to monitor the legislative process. And another question is whether the legislation is future-proof, whether it is ready for what is coming. Uh, there is artificial intelligence, there is Bitcoin, and there will be many others other things to come that we still don't know. So the legislation should, or this panel should uh, discuss what the big data are, how they are used, whether in, uh, artificial intelligence is used efficiently for them, what the legislative framework should be, and whether it helps the development in this area. And uh, it is also important in the context of the Czech presidency, which starts on the 1st of July. And with this, we will obviously have perhaps a bigger say in orienting the legislation. I have asked all of the panelists to uh, give us very brief introduction, each of them, in which they will share with us their opinion on this general background which I presented, uh, what their personal perception of the topic is, and after that we will move on to 
some questions and of, of course once again uh, you can send your questions through the slido application let me start uh, with uh, uh, the mep data Kharanzova. Uh, i would like to ask you for your brief introduction thank you very much for your invitation to uh, this panel. Uh, very briefly, I agree with everything what you said. Data is the gold of the 21st century. It's not only the businesses in the IT sector who say so, but also the politicians. The pandemic showed uh, and contributed to the acceleration of the development. We basically moved to the online world overnight, both uh, in business and in schooling and so on. And at the same time, we realized uh, what the challenges are for the future uh, and which way to take for the future. You mentioned something like the digital offensive. Um, uh, when you hear people talking about Brussels and regulating, it always sounds horrible. But in fact, we are trying to respond to the current situation. On the one hand, uh, we see the issue of balance between privacy protection and uh, not uh, giving barriers to innovation and uh, some le legal framework for sh data sharing uh, of data, not only no on the national level, but also on the European level. If uh, you consider that in Malta, uh, there are some 30 percent of businesses who are able and who know how to work and process big data in the Czech Republic, it's about only 10 percent of uh, the companies. Uh, another aspect is uh, using big data, for example, in healthcare, which we have already done during the pandemic. The anonymized big data helped us uh, identify the uh, disease uh, focuses. And so. This whole change requires change in legislation, and we are trying to grasp it in one way or another. We need to protect the user, the consumer, uh, for the users to have trust in using the environment. At the same time, we must uh, provide secure and uh, sort of regulated room for the small and medium-sized companies so that they are able to work on the market, to use the data, and to feel safe. And then we have, of course, the large corporations. Uh, we have succeeded in uh, allowing the freedom of of free movement of data across the European Union, and now we have to move on. At this moment, we have to progress, and we should find the uh, countries of the sim similar mindset. We shouldn't or we should be very, very careful to prevent uh, building up a certain uh, wall between Europe and the rest of the world, in particular America. We have to be seeking uh, some common uh, topics, and I'm very happy that at the moment uh, we are talking successfully with the American partners. So it is important that we set the rules together with America. Thank you. And that takes us to the next 
speaker, and that is Vladimir Zurilla. And then we'll hear from the two remaining speakers. So thank you very much also for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak here. Uh, so what comes next? Uh, everybody would uh, want to know that, and particularly investors who look at what is going on uh, with uh, cryptocurrency, whether the exit or not yet. Well, we worked a lot with the data during the COVID pandemic. It was for the first time when uh, I think that decisions were made based on data. And for example, transaction in state administrations are not measured. And that means what kind of services are actually used. And there are no KPIs set uh, to assess individual services. So COVID actually showed us that it's important to look at data also in the state administration. At the very beginning, when we didn't even have the smart uh, quarantine, but only webs were uh, being developed, monitoring where there is COVID. And we started to plan uh, where the capacities for testing and then for vaccinations are going to be uh, built. As for new technologies, I think that we are not good at uh, the adoption in the state administration. I'm not talking about telco industry. It, um, it helps a lot with uh, the building of 5G networks, but we look uh, for opportunities also for blockchain uh, technologies. Now it seems that uh, the European wallet is being prepared for documents. Uh, blockchain uh, technology could be used for validations, and that might be um, well developed. And we are getting closer within Europe. Uh, we have um, a login that is working well. To get with our ID, we could uh, actually log in uh, to services uh, in other countries, and it works uh, vice versa, thanks to certification. So there are many things going on for Europe uh, to be a single space, and for me, it's the right approach. Uh, there are no borders today. So every single employer knows that uh, uh, they are actually on the whole EU market, uh, not uh, on a single market. We deal with many issues uh, in terms of businesses. Uh, we do it, uh, but also there are many projects uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on data-driven government. And that means uh, what kind of uh, data to monitor, uh, assess, and then uh, which areas to invest in. That's all from me as a beginning. Thank you, Vlado. And now I would like to ask uh, Alžbeta Krausova, who will perhaps talk about projects uh, that are even more future-looking. So what comes next? Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I had a speech prepared, but if you ask me what comes next, I think that the next direction is uh, neuro um, link between uh, neurology and biology and digital technologies, and we'll see um, about the development. In 2020, the Council of Europe uh, issued a statement that we should focus on these technologies. But to go back to AI and its regulations, even these technologies use AI. And I have to say that um, when I look at where we got uh, in the area of artificial regulation, I really appreciate all the persons who participate in it, because regulation of these new technologies is very complex. Uh, since 2017, when the European Parliament uh, published one of its recommendations mentioning 
responsibility and e-person. Expert literature and also political documents and draft uh, legislation um, doubled, tripled, uh, and grew a lot. We have to focus on algorithm as well as data. Today, uh, during the era of machine learning, we have to ask whether the legislation will help us to innovate or prevent innovation altogether. The problem in this area is that when we look at data, researchers um, face a problem of having various uh, legal uh, regimes. And we talk about uh, intellectual property rights, uh, about anonymization, uh, best practices, etc. So the area is getting bigger and bigger. And now we will add also draft regulation related to algorithms. I see both positive and negative sides to it, and it's difficult to find a balance. The positive uh, goes uh, towards uh, protection of consumers and users. And what I like most is uh, promotion of autonomy. AI systems and big data could be a tool for accumulating power and influence. And strengthening the autonomy system should prevent it. We also see that the European efforts inspire other countries at the international level. There are many debates going on. And the question is whether we would be able to harmonize them. But the EU has inspired the UA. They prepare the AI Bill of Rights. And we'll see whether we will be able to harmonize it. And I agree that the EU should not be isolated. And EU is quite active in all the international bodies and institutions to find common principles and to promote our values. Uh, it should uh, join in um, transatlantically with other countries. Yes, wonderful uh, transatlantic cooperation in the digital world is a big topic. And now uh, there will be a transatlantic uh, connection also with Avast. I will ask Andre Vlček, who is the uh, CEO, CEO of a global company already today with millions of users and a product or products uh, uh, that are closely linked to our today's topic. And that is the use of modern digital technologies. Uh, Andre, I will ask you for your introductory words. Hello, I hope that you can hear me well. I do apologize. I'm not with you in Kalin in person. Unfortunately, I had a positive COVID test uh, during the weekend, so I didn't want to risk it. So I will follow up on what uh, Deta Haranzova has said. And that is uh, that um, it's been said that data is uh, the current crude oil um, or the gold of the 21st century, which is an interesting concept. And in a way, it's truthful, as uh, some financial value could be based on it. But then um, there are some discrepancies to this analogy. Uh, you know, um, uh, considering the, uh, let's say, crude oil rush, and uh, we really need to have uh, much uh, better rules of the game and regulation. But it's not only about regulation. There is uh, also a certain uh, progress and change, um, and we see it in the past four to five years. When we look at uh, personal identifiable information, approach of companies uh, to such data is changing. Five years ago, this type of data 
was considered to be the most valuable part. Uh, the cherry on top of the icing, something that the companies uh, want to protect most. Most of the businesses uh, see it as a toxic asset or radioactive material that they do not want to have. BID is valuable but also quite risky and uh, protection is uh, a very difficult topic uh, and it is because of e-privacy, DMA, GDPR and other types of regulations uh, that apply to all businesses active in Europe. It is also given by the fact that personal data turn to be a valuable honeypot uh, for attackers or hackers. It is a prestigious um, thing for hackers to collect uh, databases of BDIs and uh, trade with it. In 2021, about 6 billion records leaked, and these were related to PIDs and a similar numbers could be seen in previous years, so the figures are enormous. And I uh, see a change uh, in the approach of businesses, so they do not want to have as uh, uh, much data as possible, but um, we actually uh, go to a new encryption technologies and or the situation when the businesses do not want to have the data at all and carry uh, the business without the need of having such data. Thank you, Andre, for your introductory word. I have prepared a couple of questions myself, and you have actually answered some of them in your opening uh, presentations. Andre, To what extent do you address uh, security of uh, IoT connected uh, devices? Is IoT a risk for a for the business in terms of cybersecurity? So I believe uh, this is uh, on the increase, so it is going to be quite an important. Uh, topics. Well, IoT is one of the buzzwords uh, when talking about Bitcoin, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. IoT is definitely uh, uh, one of the key topics. Uh, it basically means that a non-digital, non-computer device becomes a small computer. And uh, it may apply to very consumer-oriented products. This applies to businesses where basically factories uh, no longer employ people but computers. And the whole system is also managed by microprocessors. So security is crucial to prevent any hacking and intrusion in the system. A uh, couple of figures. We are talking about billions of devices that are connected to the internet. And I'm not talking about mobile phones or computers or MD processors. But I mean, ordinary uh, processors or uh, ordinary devices that are used like vehicles, all kinds of machinery used in uh, uh, factories and so on. So it's quite easy to imagine uh, the fatality of any hacking or intrusion in these uh, devices and reprogramming uh, their processes would, uh, would have. On the other hand, 
for the moment, these concerns uh, have not been confirmed, despite the risks, existing risks. Uh, so far, the hackers have been focusing on the traditional devices. So in 99.9% .9 cases, hackers attack conventional computers, mobile phones, uh, variables, and by far less these uh, sort of conventional devices. But I wouldn't rely on that, and I think IoT security will become one of the crucial strategic areas of cybersecurity. And uh, you can see uh, also this reflected in the number of people and businesses that are devoted. There are hundreds and hundreds of startups that focus on this particular topic, and it will be growing even more with the complexity of the devices and facilities. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to the one big thing that's on the table today, and that's the regulatory framework for the digital economy. Uh, some of uh, the panelists have already mentioned uh, uh, this framework. Uh, once again, let me ask each of the panelists individually uh, how they perceive the legislation proposed by the European institutions, what they believe it is going to bring, whether it is sufficiently future-proof, or whether it may not uh, contribute rather to fragmentation of the markets, uh, whether they think it is a step in the right direction towards uh, European competitiveness, and also towards the protection of European citizens. And once again, I'm not saying it is not. Uh, I just ask question as the moderator. Generally speaking, these legislative acts are welcome, but we have to still be cautious uh, about their wording. So taking into consideration the whole legislative package, what are its risks, what should be its benefits, what is going to bring. So data. Perhaps the most important thing is to make it future-proof. And uh, once again, this is extremely uh, difficult because we don't know what's going to come next. And if we want to design legislation that works another 10 or even 20 years, it's difficult. Therefore, the uh, legislative uh, efforts should not be responsive, like trying to address one single American company, uh, but we should be looking into the future. I'm not saying that similarly, like we didn't uh, adopt an act against Yahoo 10 years ago, and then we shouldn't be uh, adopting an act against Google today. We should be adopting uh, legislation that sets clear rules for everybody. And when we talk to the businesses, we hear, yes, at least we know what I'm required to do. As for the Data Act, uh, which is on the table currently, uh, one thing is whether you look at it uh, from the cyber uh, perspective or from the perspective of a consumer. If you purchase a glass, it's all yours. You hold it, you own it, you possess it. Today, when you buy a home appliance, you don't even realize that it collects certain data and it, the data goes somewhere. And you, as the consumer, should know what it does, where it goes, and you should be aware of whether you share the data from your uh, vehicle with the insurance company automatically or not. 
So the general objective is also to make uh, the situation of SMEs easier. We see today that their access to big data is more difficult than for, for the big uh, large enterprises. Uh, we also have to want to have a framework for using the data in situations like the pandemic on, or similar crisis situations. And we want to find a reasonable balance. Uh, in the debate on uh, regulating artificial intelligence, we are trying and seeking the balance between the protection and the way to innovation for the businesses. It's really difficult. Um, you, you will have things like facial recognition, and the discussion is whether you uh, should uh, leave it completely free or whether it could be used for public in, in public interest and how and to what extent. So the answers are definitely not easy. The European legislation, as it is, uh, as, as it has been designed, uh, is going in the right direction. The basic principle should be setting the rules in such a way that we are not uh, um, in any way damaging the ties with uh, America. In Brussels, there is a certain tendency to be sort of self-centered, but we should keep in touch with America. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, this is uh, exactly a topic important for the Czech Republic, and the Czech Republic is one of the countries supporting uh, the group of like-minded countries that um, support the transatlantic ties. And um, if we break these ties, then uh, we will lose uh, the biggest ally for the EU, and it will be difficult to mend. But um, we know that, uh, of course, they are not only uh, good people on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, but we need to keep the dialogue alive. And I can see a huge potential if um, task forces under the EU American uh, platform uh, work. Um, and these are the groups that focus on technology standards, AI, etc. And now I would like to uh, give the same question to uh, Vlado Zurela, as the new legislation covers not only businesses, research organizations, but of course also the role of the state in data and digital economy. I will not repeat what uh, was said as I agree with it. I look at it from our perspective. Uh, we need uh, data sharing. Uh, well, individual ministries um, in the past were not able to share data, and it was a problem uh, or an issue uh, whether uh, one ministry that uh, is the administrator of the data could actually provide it to another ministry. And we all expect that, for example, tax returns will be pre-filled, that uh, you do not need to provide the same data several times. And in the past years, we managed to um, actually raise these uh, obstacles. And now it is important uh, for the data to be shared even more among individual uh, ministries. Uh, so it all started with the basic registers and the data platform that it changes it all. But as I say, the legislation, even in uh, areas uh, that are so important, uh, need to wait for the piece of legislation. 
EU legislation should respect also these aspects, and we need to share data not only within the Czech Republic, but also across member states, so that we could use the data and so that it could work. As for the legislation, I do not have the answer to the question how to set it uh, so that the legislation does not uh, make an obstacle for innovation and uh, how to keep competitiveness and innovation within businesses, but on the other hand, to ensure security. The, has been a long discussion whether to install cameras and thus uh, uh, ensure a secure environment or whether it actually uh, is uh, a certain barrier or you limit a personal space. Uh, we will have a similar discussion on that. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so you covered the topic of uh, Data Sharing and Data Governance Act. And now I will ask Alžbeta Krausová, could you answer the same question, legislation at the European level? What are the threats and opportunities? I have to say that I welcome the principles on which the future legislation, EU legislation, is founded. From the practical point of view, it tries to rectify certain deficiencies where data are monopolized. Uh, they actually go to huge uh, foreign companies and SMEs and technology users are um, actually cannot do anything, and the legislation is trying to rectify the situation. It's uh, difficult to find the balance, uh, but uh, what I appreciate that uh, there is uh, the strengthening of personal autonomy. Two years ago at uh, our uh, institute, we started working on uh, this topic, and we see that the European Commission is focusing on this uh, topic, and large platforms in the future should have the obligation to explain the logics uh, based on which um, the content uh, is changing to you or the logics behind um, uh, targeting. And the user um, can have an opportunity to see the content that is shown to everybody, not to a particular person. Data uh, sharing within the Data Act. The users uh, should have the right to have access to their own data. I think this is also the right principle. And we actually take over the US logic. The European law looks at personal data uh, to, as uh, the personality uh, law, but the US sees it as an economic um, law. So the person should have more control over it and uh, should have an opportunity to behave autonomously and perhaps uh, to monetize um, its data. Uh, then uh, also and there is this principle, the higher the risk, uh, the higher the responsibility. Of course, uh, there are also issues. Uh, some of the businesses uh, will have a huge uh, entry barrier to the market and we could kill the innovation altogether and it is not the intention or it should not be the intention. The question is uh, whether we could also rectify the situation here by providing solutions such as uh, for SMEs that will have to comply with the legislation to have uh, pre-prepared solutions in order to remove the barrier. Thank you very much. Uh, we will perhaps uh, go back to legislation and law, uh, but um, 
Let's also hear from Andre Vlachek, uh, new legislation in the digital world. I'm sure you also um, discuss this issue. Um, what is your opinion about the new digital package? In general, I would say that we believe regulation plays an important role and it's needed. And we perceive it, if you look around the world, EU is uh, taken as a sort of role model and the rest of the world, including the US, are inspired. And they lag behind a little bit uh, and uh, Washington is a little bit um, behind Brussels, and that's the positive uh, piece of news. I'm most interested in legislation about those, those aspects uh, that uh, actually restrict certain things, but those also that create new opportunities. It seems to me that uh, there is a problem uh, with connection. Are you there? Yes, uh, we are all familiar uh, with this situation, uh, with all the virtual calls that we participated in during COVID. So uh, perhaps, and we hope that Andrzej Wilczek uh, will rejoin us, uh, we'll give him the space to finish his idea. And now perhaps uh, some questions. Uh, from Slido, and then we can go back to my questions. Uh, the questions at the top, uh, I think, is a question that was asked uh, during the debate between Sara and Zdeněk Zajček. I'm not sure whether Vlada would want to answer. Let's leave it if we have enough time and go to uh, the next two questions. And now I can't see anything, but the screen is dark and the tab tablet is also <laughs> locked. Uh, have you managed to read them? Well, Facebook. Uh, what about Facebook? Um, uh, is it the naughty boy or girl Facebook? What to do with it? I think the question was what's going to be the relationship between the European Union and Facebook. My answer is none. There is no relationship between the EU and Facebook. What we do during the debate on the digital environment in the EU is setting the rules in Europe that will apply to European businesses. And of course, any other businesses are welcome as long as they comply with the rules. And it is nothing against Google, against Facebook. The fact is that this is the largest digital market in the world. I mentioned that there are 150 million users more than in America. So it has great potential and all the technology businesses make use of it and in the past we saw that there were certain sores and we are now setting the rules to prevent any disputes for the future because we are setting up the uh, conditions ex ante and all the businesses coming to the European market will simply have to comply with the rules. And the issues such as uh, data protection or uh, targeted uh, advertising, privacy protection, uh, algorithms, offering and uh, sequencing the information for you, and 
uh, the way the algorithms target children, for example, the way uh, large platforms respond to uh, spreading harmful, if not illegal, information. So all these issues uh, could not be addressed simply by a voluntary decision of these uh, enterprises and of the platforms. And there will be a rule that will tell them that they are obliged to prevent spreading war propaganda, for example. So this is something that we have to do. We need to set the rules of the game on the uh, European playing field. When talking to my colleagues uh, from over the Atlantic, they basically address the same topics and the same issues. They may have slightly different perspective because privacy protection may be perceived slightly differently in America and in Europe. But in general, the topics that we are trying to address through the Digital Data Act or Digital Services Act, uh, they address issues which the others have to resolve as well. Thank you. There is one additional question concerning Facebook, uh, which data partially answered. So you answered that there is no partnership between EU and Facebook. Is there any risk for Facebook in and their operation in Europe? Would anyone uh, want to respond, including Andre? Uh, Andre, we haven't heard the rest, uh, the, the second half of your uh, answer. So perhaps you want to finish your answer concerning the legislation. What I wanted to say was that the things that I like most are those that enable new business, new opportunities. And uh, what I see in Europe now is uh, ADAS 2.0, and that concerns the digital wallets. And this is a topic where Europe is m much ahead of uh, America, for example. Uh, in America, they only are starting to uh, turn to digital driving licenses, at, and not even on the federal level, but only on the uh, state levels. Uh, the digital wallet is not a simple wallet for your pictures, for, for your driving license, or your ID card. But the important thing is what is behind it. So that's all the services that will have an impact on using a digitized identity. And when you consider the economic business impact of this, it's enormous. Can you hear me? Yeah, there was a moment of pause, but we do hear you. Uh, this is also a topic that relates uh, and concerns social media, not only Facebook, but uh, also uh, Twitter and uh, what Elon Musk wants to do with them. Um, I do apologize. I can see and hear you well. So all I wanted to say was that one of the potential and important solutions for social media is better verification of the person or entity present on the social uh, network. The current uh, legislation is 
not ideal or the current rules are not ideal but def definitely the direction in which it goes is right and it should help move uh, digital transformation forward including many problems of social media that we are addressing currently thank you the image was still but we could hear you all the time when uh, talking about EIDA DAS uh, this brings us back to public administration and uh, we have another question from Slido that should probably go to Vlado. Could you mention at least one example of the data driven government uh, area that has been or is being implemented in the Czech Republic? Well, as I already mentioned, the largest project was a data processing during COVID, and uh, it helped us uh, set up how and where to test the people, how to set up the structure in general. And the second project, or there were two projects uh, that were started but not completed. And we were, as the national agency, were partners in a project which looked at all the sources of data that we could use. And seeing that, we try to use the data uh, for the implementation of the epidemic measures. So seeing the source data, we wanted to monitor how this is reflected or any measures are reflected uh, after some time. So this has not been completed. Perhaps this will continue later. And then there was another purely IT project. And we, in, under this project, we looked at the numbers of licenses used in reality at different ministries. Let's uh, say uh, if we saw the numbers of licenses uh, at different ministries, we compared how many they use, why a larger ministry uses fewer licenses than a smaller ministry, and so on. We also wanted to see the structure of the data uh, and all this also in terms of uh, data sharing among the ministries. This is definitely going to continue. There is a larger ongoing project on the uh, utilization of data from the elementary registers. Thank you. That was uh, yet another Slido question. Mm, I would go back to the question I have pre-prepared for the panelists. It would be a pity not to use the opportunity of having Alžbeta Karauzova from the Institute of State and Law. And it is a more philosophical question how the law responds to development of new technologies. And as uh, the development is fast and uh, faster and faster, such as AI, is law able to respond flexibly to such a quick development? And then the second question is whether we would be able to uh, resolve the issue of responsibility or liability for damage uh, as the technology advances so quickly. Yes, the law is able to respond uh, to anything. The question is how quickly and how well. Uh, the technologies are developing so quickly, and although the approach is to uh, actually avoid risks ex ante, we do we won't have to be able to uh, predict everything. So the law should be based on principles. And another factor is to realize that the law guarantees 
a certain continuity and it should or could be a guarantee of something that will remain constant and we could rely on that. Then we will have, of course, problems that legislation will not be adopted uh, quickly enough and it will not be fine-tuned. That's why the access to new technologies should be based on principles. And when we talk about the liability for autonomous systems, it's one of the areas where we should really use principles. In 2018, the European Commission uh, founded a, a task force uh, on uh, a liability, and there were 16 experts, and we tried to come up with such principles. And in the future, we should have a draft resolution on uh, uh, liability for AI. And I'm not quite sure what is it going to be based on, as there were many ideas. Our um, group came up uh, with some guidances, and actually the liability uh, should uh, be uh, given to that entity that has uh, the largest control. But in order to ensure legal certainty, we should also use the principle of subjective uh, liability in certain, in certain cases. Imagine there'll be a small damage and the user of an intelligent system, for example, navigation system or another smart gadget uh, would have to pre-prove um, that it was the fault of the system, etc. So let's say up to 500 euros or to a certain amount, we could have the objective liability. It's the manufacturer and then the manufacturer um, could uh, um, you know, turn elsewhere depending on their capacities. So thank you very much uh, for uh, the opinion on the future of law. And now let's have a look uh, at the questions from Slido. I have a question for Dita Haranzova. What kind of key should be used when we talk about uh, uh, the uh, personal uh, rights and the rights of uh, companies to conduct uh, business. Yes, that's a philosophical question and it's not uh, easy to answer it. I always focus it um, when I deal with individual cases. It's interesting to have a debate with colleagues from other member states. For example, for my German colleagues, they see the issue of privacy as uh, being above everything. And perhaps it's related to uh, the national identity. For me, the key is that there has to be a balance. It cannot be one-sided. Privacy of a, an individual is above all. So there'll be no cameras uh, because cameras can record what we do. And the second extreme is that we'll leave uh, cameras to uh, record uh, whatever um, you want. And uh, the owners of the data can also do whatever they want with the data. So that was just a simplified example, but uh, it's clear that we need to find a balance, for example, use of such technologies in case of terrorist attacks or in case, well, terrorist attacks uh, is perhaps the best example. And in other cases, uh, the individual must, well, will decide what will happen with my data. And the second are the um, uh, the systems um, uh, uh, without a driver, uh, what well, cars uh, without drivers. What will happen to the data? It's a difficult debate. We try to find a balance. Uh, there are various uh, viewpoints, and uh, then of course uh, the approach. Uh, 
of individual states is different. Uh, uh, well, you actually look at it from the point of view of member states, and sometimes it copies the debate in the EP, but we do not have uh, time for that, I guess. I would add, as uh, I'm not purely a moderator anyway, we have 2.5 minutes, and um, I would like to ask two more questions related to uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are two questions, and I'll ask whoever wants to answer them. What do you think about the fact that some countries, such as Salvador or Central uh, African Republic, uh, they adopted Bitcoin as uh, their um, legal currency? And also, what do you think about uh, uh, the fall of cryptocurrency. Could it be the final fall uh, for Bitcoin? So the first question whether uh, cryptocurrency could become uh, an official tool of uh, monetary policy, I think it will be an up-to-date uh, issue also with respect to uh, the uh, nomination or uh, of the new governor of the Czech uh, National Bank and uh, his appointment, actually. I will uh, answer the first question. I was lucky uh, not having Terra, but I know some of the people who are in a bad situation. I quite like uh, one of the answers. Uh, it was said by Victor Fischer. And he did a blockchain fund, and he said that he's not thinking uh, about a huge potential because uh, Bitcoin is volatile, up and down. And if you if it goes up, you do not want to uh, actually uh, use it. And if it goes down, you say, well, you want to keep it because it will go up uh, anyway. So I do agree with that opinion. I think. It is the biggest chance uh, uh, for those uh, that are linked to dollar, but I think it's not Bitcoin. Anybody wants to respond uh, to cryptocurrency? No, I was warned that I should really finish on time. Uh, so the last uh, 20 seconds uh, I'll use for a big thank to all the panelists. It was a great debate on the topic. And uh, hopefully uh, you learned also um, some new information about the future. Uh, so thank you very much, Dita Charanzová, Alžbeta Krauzová, Andrzej Vlček, and Vladimir Zorila. And that's all. And enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. What do I think about it? We would stay here for three days. And uh, it was uh, a full and lively panel. Now we'll have a brief coffee break, 15 minutes, have a cup of coffee, and then we'll talk about financial technology of the future and smart mobility for the 21st century. So enjoy your coffee break and see you in 15 minutes.
что наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. A global cyber attack. We've never seen anything on this scale. It can travel from computer to computer. Hospitals paralyzed, computers had shut down. WannaCry is different. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled, and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not going to happen. And he was, he was in shock. Suddenly, we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry? It was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what not Petya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved but also the evolution of intent. We have TV station who have been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also were, uh, doesn't work. It was real shock for Kyiv citizens. 75% of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. Cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organisations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting, and if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens. u šestého ročníku konference Digitální Česko. Pandemie nesmírně pomohla digitalizaci a možná více, než si uvědomujeme. Vliv koronaviru je pandemie na vliv digitální služeb, tak my jako Česká národní banka to v té oblasti, kterou my sledujeme, úplně nepozorujeme. My stále vidíme nárůst hotovosti, pokud se volně o platebním styku. Projekty, které jsme začali, či už se jedná o transformaci úřadu, či už přinesení cloudu, portálu občana nebo identity pro všechny občany, rozhodně spějí k tomu, aby Česko bylo digitální. Z mého pohledu 
máme teď jedinečnou příležitost ten, tu tragédii covidu využít k něčemu pozitivnímu a to by právě měl být přechod k elektronickému zdravotnictví. Když jsme si tady říkali, že digitalizace už v dopravě je, hodně dopředu je třeba železniční doprava a vlaky, postupuje do té dopravy osobní, ale také do našeho způsobu využívání. Řada z nás už jsme si vyzkoušeli mobilem odemknout nějakou koloběžku a pak po ní chviličku je, takže pomáhá jednoznačně a bude pomáhat dál a dál v ohromným způsobem, jaký si asi nedokážeme představit. Tak já mám z toho letošního ročníku radost, protože přichází po takové té covidové pauze. Je tady na nějakých 150 vystavených projektů a mám pocit, že je tady relativně plno. Co se týká účasti ČVUT, nebo konkrétně FELU, my jsme vlastně oficiálně jako ČVUT a takovým odborným partnerem festivalu. Je tady vystavená formule, roboti, LEGO, robosoutěž, je tady toho, nebo Teslu Transformator, takže z toho mám taky radost. Co se týká mojí účasti jako vystavovatele, tak musím říct, že to trochu minimalizuju, protože to bylo hodně náročné starat se o expozici i o festival, tak jsem letos to nechal na, na kolesí. Už jsem se to prošla a je to strašně moc různých projektů, začínají CNC frézama, 3D tiskem a končí to nějakýma vzdušnicama a chemickýma pokusama. Já to vlastně mám několik osobních projektů, které jsem dělala ve volném čase. Třeba tady mám robotické rameno na přenášení věci, nebo brailu v řádek DIY, nebo taky rukavice na překlad znakové řeči, že prostě člověk jakože ukazuje znaky a ty rukavice vlastně překládají, co, co, co těma znakama říká. Mě to vždycky bavilo, jako prostě si vyrobit nějakou hračku, něco nového se u toho naučit. Já jsem se obecně o elektrotechniku začal zajímat už na základní škole. Takovým tím prvním strujcem mýho zájmu byl můj děda. Na našem stánku můžete vidět otevřená řešení pro řízení stejnosměrného motoru s levnými destičkami. Fakulta elektrotechnická je dobrá škola, studuje na ní spousta šikovných lidí se zájmem o elektrotechniku a ten počet stánků ukazuje, že mají výsledky. Putění, vyrábění, ať už v elektronice nebo v jiných oborech, prostě tady v Čechách je rozšířené a máme to rádi. Je to vlastně možnost jednak předvíst, co jsem třeba dělal a podívat se, co dělali ostatní lidé a taky se seznámit s některými dalšími makery a načen si do elektrotechniky a programování. Se skutečně tady kloubí dohromady a vystavovatelé z různých oborů, takže z toho mám radost.
fearless isn't the goal. The goal is where fearless can take you. Your organization, innovation, growth, focusing on your mission. The threat of a breach does scare me. But to me, security is life. Do you live your life wondering around what if, or do you think about what's possible? Fearless means taking a comprehensive approach across security, compliance, and identity. Integration to protect every device and platform. Using threat intelligence across clouds. We're changing our mindset, but now more and more we use cloud technologies to protect, to even to raise the security bar. Fearless means finding confidence through best-in-class solutions being able to simplify and still strengthen. I strongly believe that security is a shared responsibility. It's not just on me, it's not just on the InfoSec team, it's not just on the physical security team. All the elements are intertwined. Because we don't just believe in being fearless. We believe in helping you put fearless to work. находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. A global cyber attack. We've never seen anything on this scale. It can travel from computer to computer. Hospitals paralyzed, computers had shut down. Wanna cry is different. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say. And he said, we've been hacked. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome back after the coffee break. Welcome back also to our stream viewers. I'm sure you're still with us because of the topics. Uh, my task is now to invite you 
to the next panel and I will switch to English. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I would love to welcome you to the next panel, which is the financial technologies of the future. Um, uh, not long ago, things like blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and the way that the fintech sector hedge funds with the help of artificial intelligence are evolving. It used to be sci-fi, but now it's absolutely normal. Um, and we have a very, very dynamic changing environment in this regard, and technology is playing a huge role in that. To tell us exactly what role technologies are playing in that and how we can prepare for the future and really become digital Czech Republic, um, there are the following people. Andrzej Kovatik, who's the member of the European Parliament and Renew Europe. Uh, Ott Velsberg, who's the government chief data officer from the Ministry of Economy and Communications from Estonia. Um, Greta Schulter, the secretary general of the European FinTech Association and government and public affairs manager N26 from Germany. Jan Blazek, Chairman of the Board, Banking Identity from the Czech Republic, um, which is something we've already discussed in the previous VIP talk. And finally, the moderator, Jana Brodani, the Executive Director of the Capital Market Association of the Czech Republic. Um, I'm really looking forward to this panel. It's great to see such an international crowd. And over to you, Jana. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'm really happy that uh, you joined us uh, for our discussion. And uh, I would start uh, very fastly and uh, with, a, I would say, a bit uh, tricky question, which is, 10 years ago, what did you consider as the financial technology of the future? Greta, maybe starting with you. I think 10 years ago, I don't think any of us would have imagined uh, contactless payment which I think is probably something that uh, all of us are doing nowadays. Or also instant payment, just being able to send uh, someone money with a swipe on your phone. I think those are probably the two main things that uh, we couldn't have imagined and um, that it took pioneers in, in industry to push forward. But also, thankfully, uh, regulation that was very uh, future forward looking. Um, I'm thinking especially of the Payment Service Directive 2 and the open banking regime. And I think, therefore, um, yeah, that those are the things that we could probably not have imagined and um, will be exciting to see what the future holds for us. Andre, similar. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your invitation and uh, happy to be uh, with uh, you today. Well, I think uh, 10 years ago, I think we were all excited if, if we were able actually to access the, especially the banking services, but in general the financial services uh, through the internet banking or, or through our phones, uh, uh, smartphones. But I think uh, if uh, I follow up to what uh, uh, Greta has just uh, uh, said, I think, well, if you look at 10 years ago, there were already bases of uh, technologies uh, such as uh, NFC or, or APIs. And those are actually basics of what we have, what we have today, be it the, the contact, uh, contactless payments, um, the, um, the development of, of uh, um, various uh, range of financial services uh, that we can actually access. And um, I think um, maybe, maybe, maybe we can start with a, with a little survey. Like 10 years ago, how many, how many of you actually went to a bank like in person regularly, like 10 years ago? Yeah? How many of you do, uh, go now, today? You see? So I think that's, that's, that's where we see, I mean, the, the bigger difference. Well, actually, my bank sometimes tries to get me uh, to the bank desk uh, in person, <laughs> but I really try to resist uh, as much as possible. <laughs> Jan, for you, 10 years ago, what did you think, well, this will be the, the technology of the future? First, just to explain why I'm still going to, to the bank. I'm not going to the branches, I'm going to the bank because banks are our shareholders. Uh, so that's why I need to keep going there. I will just maybe repeat because Greta already said for me 10 years ago, definitely the contactless card. And uh, because this is something that won't change our, let's say, behavior, uh, how, we use the, how we use the card, we start to use it more often. And I think also Czech Republic was one of the leaders in, let's say, implementing this technology. And then uh, I would also mention, and this is something close to the contactless payments, and then let's say the tokenization, the possibility to, to pay with the cards at the internet. Probably we don't, today we don't even think about it that we are doing something like that. 
we got the car data in our mobile phone, we got the data in our web browser, and we are just paying, paying, paying. Not, com uh, not complaining, but let's say just from the user perspective and UX, this is something what I really like. So definitely for me, the uh, innovation uh, uh, in 10 years, the contactless cards and the tokenization of the credit cards. Ot, what do you think? Uh, yes, <clears throat> so I'm representing kind of uh, Estonian perspective on this question. So right now as a background, we have uh, on electronic transactions, 99% penetration in the whole society. So already back then, I, I didn't use, inter, uh, kind of didn't go to the branch itself. But looking right now back, I guess from a, from a person's perspective living in Estonia, I guess the biggest difference is that I can already forward everything related to investment portfolio to my tax declaration. And in return, that means that it's just one click. And uh, this year, my tax declaration took three minutes. All of the investments, transactions that I have done is automatically forwarded to the tax authority. Similarly, from last year, December, you can get basically a credit loan just by clicking on, yes, you consent this financial institution to access your government health data. I guess 10 years ago, I wouldn't imagine this would to be possible, but today it is. So this, um, this shows that the government and the private sector gets more and more intertwined. So um, really excited to see what the next decade will bring. Yes, and uh, governments and regulatory bodies can uh, really help uh, uh, move uh, forward with, uh, with the financial technology. And that's uh, why I would ask Andre, what are you doing in the European Parliament with regards uh, to the financial uh, technology? Is it moving? Uh, it is moving, yeah. We, we, we do, I think, quite a lot, but it depends on the perspective. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago at a conference on, on blockchain and, and crypto uh, currencies, and, uh, and we, were, we were actually accused that uh, we do too much in terms of regulation. And uh, uh, when I speak to some other st uh, stakeholders, uh, I hear that we don't don't do enough. So I think it's really about the perspective. But um, indeed, um, I think, well, we, we're trying to keep the pace. But um, to be honest, I think the, if, if you look at the pace of the financial uh, innovation in the financial services area, uh, it's, it's pretty hard, pretty hard to keep it. Uh, yeah, that, so the idea, it, at least this is what I usually try to uh, fight for and promote, is when we, when we speak about regulation, um, when we try to introduce um, new types of regulation to make it uh, future uh, forward looking, to, to make it uh, principle based, to make it rather simple, uh, not, not too prescriptive because then we can end up in a situation when the regulation can be obsolete even before it's, ad it's adopted. Um, we are currently working on a number of um, uh, regulations that are linked to uh, the recent uh, digital finance package pre presented by European Commission back in 2020. A um, number of, uh, of files uh, that are being finalized or before the finalization, um, they, they regard that there's a specific, uh, a specific act that is, is uh, uh, that touch upon, touches upon the uh, area of, of crypto assets, the market in, market in crypto assets uh, act. Um, uh, there's another one uh, on digital operation resilience of, uh, of financial uh, financial uh, operators, financial institutions. Uh, one that was uh, that has been already adopted, and uh, we still wait for the final uh, confirmation from the co-legislators, which introduces quite an innovative uh, approach in European scale, which is called the DLT pilot regime which should be a, a sort of a pan-European sandbox uh, where uh, the, uh, the businesses, the industry, together with the regulators, can um, test and, and uh, uh, test their innovation, test their business models in terms of, um, for instance, tokenization of securities. Um, at the same time, we are uh, discussing the new AML package, which I think is, is very much uh, closely linked especially to the digital finance area. And uh, we are waiting for um, uh, some, some proposals in areas such as uh, open uh, finance, uh, such, uh, such as uh, the revision of, of uh, payment services directive. 
um, and others. So I think there's actually a lot of things happening at the same time. Uh, it's it's exciting to uh, to actually be part of those discussions, and uh, uh, it's also very exciting to be part of the discussions, not only within the EU institutions, but also between the regulators and the stakeholders, the industry, because there's actually a lot of new um, innovation, a lot of new business models that are being introduced. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's also for us a big challenge to be able to make sure that uh, these, uh, the, you know, the pace of innovation, especially when it comes to European, uh, European companies, uh, can be sustained or promoted. Um, that's a great news that uh, that's a mix of consumer protection and enhancing the, the environment uh, uh, for business as well. And in finance, uh, um, the, the experience is uh, very often that uh, uh, we adopt the legislation uh, with the pure aim to protect the consumer, which does not always help the consumer because it's limiting the services that are available to consumers. And uh, as we say, we are uh, adopting the legislation which could be named uh, well prepared to, to win the last war, but not uh, looking in the future. So that, that's great that uh, in this area you're looking in the future. Uh, I suppose it is very similar in Estonia from the government perspective that it's not uh, only 100% the consumer protection and not developing the opportunities for business and for consumers as well. What? Yes, that's true. Uh, so I'm from Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. So we stand for economic prosperity. Of course, we um, keep a light on the citizen side as well. But what we try to do with regulation is actually avoid that at all costs. So instead of um, providing uh, different requirements, for instance, on crypto, we try to keep it everything lean. So we don't actually differentiate right now regarding crypto and uh, regular currencies as well. The taxation is the same. And as a result, everything is more understandable for people. So I think on a European level as well, we should rather think about how we support fintech community itself on a larger scale, how we enable, for instance, the uptake of open data or AI, and if there is a really crucial need, only then we should regulate. So I'm just going to bring in an example. I, I throw out the open data. This is a concrete example that we are right now addressing regarding money laundering. Estonia, Denmark, some countries have had some problems uh, in the past, uh, past years. But we came to the conclusion, if, uh, what if all the transactional data is made public as open data? Of course, it is not possible to do that using or showing people's private data, but there isn't a solution, synthetic data. So we have already carried out first, uh, we call them pilot projects on smaller scale uh, data sets, but the idea is still there. We should think about how we can support more transparency, more innovation, and if there is really a need, then we should regulate. But right now, let's support rather than restrict. I have a question for Jan, because now we are getting to the business perspective. We have heard somehow the regulatory or the governmental part, and from the business side, uh, are they moving uh, the way uh, that is helpful in Czech Republic? What about the Czech government? Uh, first, I would like to explain more the bank idea and then I will talk about the business. Uh, the word bank ID, you heard it from Zdenik Zajček and also from Mr. Bartosz uh, mentioning the bank ID. Uh, what is bank ID? We are, let's say, a company which is owned by the banks, as I mentioned. And currently we are, let's say, like a middleman or like a broker between the banks and the government and, uh, and the company. So first, our main goal is to somehow help with the digitalization and that was also the goal set by the banks. And uh, with the bank ID, it was possible that almost immediately, or let's say within a year, more than five million people here in Czech Republic receive uh, an identical mean that can be used for the government or that can be used for the companies. And now we have, uh, I would say, three, uh, three aims or three goals. The, the first is to help with the communication and, uh, let's say, education of the users. This is uh, something where the government can definitely help, not, not by the regulation, but definitely by the Let's say at least uh, at least with the communication, 
because the what we see here, and this is something what can also help the companies here in the Czech Republic from the, let's say digital perspective, the people are not so well educated. Just question from my side, uh, how many of you are able to, let's say, check if the documents was uh, signed digitally without any error, and it's okay? Three? So th this is something where we, where, uh, where we would like to start, because if you want, so let's say, a digital economy, a digital transformation, you need to again start uh, with the people. You need to explain uh, how to use the digital signature, how to, let's say, securely use the digital identification, and then uh, you, you will see the results. So that, that's the first goal. And uh, maybe at least the people from Czech, you saw that uh, during uh, March, uh, there was a like, quite large communication in Czech TV explaining how they can use the bank ID. <clears throat> the second goal uh, we have is to, uh, let's say, bring uh, easy tool for you to sign again in the Czech Republic. This is something where we can learn from Estonia because Estonia in very early, like 10 years ago, what they have done, if you receive your digital ID card, you also receive a qualified signature and the reader. So uh, uh, let's say everyone in Estonia was able to, st to use the digital signature almost immediately. This is something what we miss here in the Czech Republic and as I said, one of our goals to bring it back. Currently, via the bank ID, you can sign with the lower level um, but hopefully, and we are waiting for some uh, legislation confirmation, not legislation change, that it will be possible to get the 5 million user also the qualified signature. So that's the second goal. And the third, and this is more about your question, is to help to help the companies. Because what we experienced, let's say, in the last one and a half years when, when we are helping the companies with the bank ID, is that the Many companies, especially also the large companies, are simply not ready for the digital transformation. Uh, COVID helps a lot, sorry for saying that, but most of the company realized that they are not able to, let's say, service the people on the branches, and they were, let's say, fastly looking for some easy solution, how they can use the service via online. Uh, but still, I think one of the more, uh, let's say, uh, one of the most problems we have here with the digital transformation are the companies and the attitude to change something. If there are a company that's, that's, uh, that there are, let's say, products where, the, for example, the identification is a must, then the adoption rate is absolutely boost, boosting the levels. But a company that they don't need to use the identification, they don't need to use the electronic means, then the digital t t transformation by them is simply stagnant, not moving. So if there is area where the government can help is somehow not push the companies to uh, use digital products, but some uh, do some kind of, I don't know, I'm not saying about programs, but some kind of these tools that the government can use how to help the companies with the digitalization. I would, I would, yes. ju yeah, I would just add that uh, completely true. So one of, I, I guess, uh, Estonian, uh, in general, successes has been that we had electronic ID for a very long time, and if you have your um, ID card, mine is in the back, don't take it. Then authentication and signature, everything is included. And at the same time, uh, together with actually telecom companies, we made a huge push towards, um, decades ago, towards mobile ID. Now we have smart ID and uh, different derivatives, but this has made it a lot more easier to actually make different uh, banking transactions. My grandma is 93 she knows how to sign. So that's how easy it should be for everyone, regardless of age. And uh, as a result, of course, in Estonia as well, like uh, we have right now 93% penetration, but still, that's a huge number. But uh, um, I think this is a key thing. And the government itself should build a foundation. So for instance, data exchange help with that. Uh, if we are building different solutions, we try to make it open source or provide them to private sector as well. So the government should play a very key role in supporting the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, I will just add one number. You mentioned 93% is in Estonia. In northern countries like Sweden, uh, Norway, it's like 98%. And yeah. in Czech Republic, I would suggest because in March, we just announced that it was over 1 million users who already used the bank ID. So the penetration we expect here is uh, around 15%. So we can imagine how long is the way ahead of us.
Yes, but there are also some technical problems. So with regards to bank ID, I know it very well because I'm a Slovak citizen. So for me, the bank ID does not work because there is no authentic authentication for for the permanent residency and so on. So I can imagine there are more law technical issues that you have to deal with uh, in the Czech Republic. But we are moving the the, the right way. I will just explain, my wife is also from Slovakia and got the bank ID, so it's possible. Uh, but anyway, partially uh, you are true, we are waiting and now the ball is on the government side. We need to, because they need to migrate some data, so also everyone from Slovakia and not even from Slovakia, it's for the EU citizenship wallet, uh, so I think the bank ID will be uh, fully available from them from, I don't know, June, July. Just uh, maybe to, to complement the debate, because obviously, uh, there, there, there is a huge difference between various member states in, in the uptake of the technology, especially when it comes to the access of, of uh, publicly available services. But also this is one of, the, one of the reasons why we currently discuss on the EU level the, the European EID uh, infrastructure, so that there is possibility, regardless the, the, the residency or regardless the, the nationality, to be able actually to make sure that the systems that are running in various member states are interoperable and then there is a possibility actually to use your national ID also, also in other countries. And I think this is, this is also another step uh, when, when we, for instance, uh, uh, roll out the technology throughout uh, the member states, such, such, uh, such as the bank identity in the Czech Republic, to already see what we can do in terms of um, accessing the cross-border entire single market, because that can actually help also uh, citizens when they, when they travel, when they move, when they, when they work, when they study abroad, actually to use uh, the, the technology uh, and, and the entire system that they're used to uh, from their uh, own member states to use also uh, in, uh, in other countries. And I think this can be actually also additional, very important layer uh, on top of uh, what, is, what is being done uh, on national, uh, national level. Thank you very much. Maybe this is my next question to, to Greta. Um, from the EU business perspective, do you think for example, the suggestion of some European ID uh, would be helpful. Or what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, from the business side uh, on the EU level? Well, I would say first that uh, what Anna said earlier, that um, we definitely need simpler regulation in more simpler terms. We also do need to be not overly prescriptive. That is both true, however, I think that the main issue is another one, which she also hinted on when talking about the European ID, is that, uh, you know, I, for me the main issue is when Jan asked a couple of minutes ago, for how many of you is this possible? And there were different, or like just three people raising their hands. And I think the main issue is that we still see such a high fragmentation across the European Union member states, not just when it comes to EID. Frankly, I think that the solution to EID should be a European one rather than, than just a national one, but in a number of areas. I mean, if we just, uh, starting with the identification, um, I think most of or rather all of our members of the European FinTech Association, they do not see themselves as a French FinTech or a German FinTech or maybe also a Czech FinTech, but they see themselves as European FinTech. They want to operate across borders, um, they want to scale their business across European member states, and I think this is also something that we're always talking about, right? That we want European champions also on the global scale, that we want successful European companies that can also compete with, with other uh, competitors on the international level. However, that is just not very well possible if there are all these different requirements and rules across member states that essentially keep businesses from scaling up across member states. It starts with ID, with such something like different know your customer requirements in different member states. We have, uh, just from a purely finance perspective, we have different uh, anti-money laundering requirements, sometimes duplication of them. Sometimes, uh, for example, if you have one case, uh, you do not know if it will be effectively prosecuted across uh, state borders. We have a patchwork of consumer protection rules across different member states. Uh, we have diverging tax rules. 
Or, for example, we also have issues when it comes to obtaining your license to, for example, obtain your license in one member state that would then allow you to passport and do your business in other European member states. And I think in that sense, a future-proof regulation or what businesses would really need from politics is rather something that leads to more harmonization on European level and that sort of really aims at completing the digital single market. And I think that's basically at the core of all our, our issues that we have with uh, fintech across the European Union, that we are just not at that level yet. I would, I would just add that uh, on a European level, we actually have kind of the agreement on interoperability itself. So it's called AIDAS. So you can already use different government services using your government issued way of authentication. So um, I think European Union kind of vision on single digital market is there and um, it's rather about execution in my mind. And I, I really love kind of diversity. In Estonia you can choose similarly as well private uh, sector provided authentication methods, government provided. I think the more the merrier but you need to make sure, assure that uh, that person's identity is then uh, really kind of validated. But um, I think Europe as a whole, not to just have a dark um, kind of feeling into it, is doing the right thing right now. Yes, you're right. Uh, uh, I was laughing a bit when uh, Greta was mentioning AML because uh, I remember when we were discussing in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, the AML identification and uh, of a, a companies, and we gave an uh, example of how it they are being authenticated. Uh, for example, in uh, in the UK, and what we heard is that uh, what works for UK cannot work in Czech Republic. But we said, but, but it's European European legislation. We should all follow uh, the same rules. But the I implementation. Uh, uh, is really uh, different in different uh, countries. Jan, with, with respect of the of the local business, do you think we are really getting, for example, to the European identification? Do you think that in a horizon of I think two, three, four, five year, five years, we will get to this level? Or, or what obstacles do you see from the Czech perspective? Well. For me, that this is something when the companies and the people simply need time. And uh, again, I will just repeat myself, like you can see the example in Estonia and in Nordic, you just need to understand that they started in 2004. In, Est in case of Estonia, let's say the full line chance in 2014, something like that. But it's more than 10 years and uh, in the Czech Republic we are at the very beginning. And uh, to repeat, we need to communicate, we need to explain to people how to use it and the same for the companies. Uh, just, just giving you, for example, a communication with some, let's say, uh, uh, not national, but like a big consultancy company, we should sign an agreement. So we send them a digitally signed agreement. Next week, we return the, uh, the physical copies, sign it physically with, digital signet, with our digital signature printed. And this is something that will not change, let's say, immediately. This is something that will need time to grow. Another example is, for example, Belgium. Belgium started a digital initiative. It's, it's me in 2000, uh, 2019 or 18. Doesn't matter. Now they are on the level of penetration more than 30 percent, and they are really pushing it hard. So for me, the new EU legislation, the the wallet, it's not a game changer. It's something good to have uh, on place because it will help with the harmonization but the change needs to be done locally by the governments and this is something where they need to help. For example, the EU wallet implementation if done correctly, meaning it will be available to everyone and again you need something why I should install it. I need a reason why I should use the apps. So for, for me the reason is that there is something where I can use it. So for the application you need companies to use it, you need government use cases where to use it, and we are back where the government can help. Start rolling out digital agencies, switch the thinking to the digital first. This is something what the companies are already working with. That, and uh, I think there was a uh, last time, there was a nice example uh, from the Ministry of uh, Social Anivity. 
uh, that was linked to the to the to the uh, to the crisis with Ukraine, and then they they simply within like a month uh, roll out an application that was pure digital, and that was let's say for the first time where there was a government agenda where you can uh, that can, that can be fulfilled only digitally. It was not possible to to go to the office or to the, to the bureau and uh, fulfill some kind of formula. It was only digital agenda. So that's the first one, and we need some more, more and more, so the people and the company will, uh, will simply use to it. So we need to be patient, we need more time, and keep on the communication and education. Yes, yes, uh, it's always about the communication, because if it's not done right, then the people are not that willing to adopt the, the new, new uh, idea, uh, so uh, uh, I will add one more thing, and that, uh, that was the discussion that you can use it, let's say, also, let's say, European wide. Uh, yes, there is already IDAS 1 in place, and uh, just the cross border use, you can count it on hands because there are no use cases uh, for the cross, -bo cross border use. And again, this is something that will be not especially solved by the except for the Nordic and Estonia, sorry. Uh, there is quite high cross border use. And again, this is not something that will be changed just by, uh, just by the legislation. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, Ot, this question is for you, but uh, I would ask maybe later also Andre, how do they deal with it? And uh, especially with regards to the recent Russian attack on, on Ukraine, uh, the question of cyber security or cyber defense became a crucial uh, for, uh, for the European countries. Uh, could you share with us some best practices uh, with regards to the cyber uh, defense of Estonia? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as many here might know, Estonia was the first country to have a, a huge cyber attack in 2008 um, by someone. Uh, so, <clears throat> from that day on, uh, cybersecurity is one of the most crucial investment uh, areas for the government. So even in, uh, in cases where uh, for digitalization as a whole we are relying on European structure funds, then cybersecurity is always kind of a crucial aspect. And it is uh, really about base hygiene that we need to develop. So regarding uh, best practices, we do have some um, but it's more complicated, uh, of course. So, um, first of all, we adopted the German ISCA. Uh, now we are switching to ISO standard, uh, but the idea is that on every different, depending on the data itself, you have requirements on integrity of the data and so forth. Um, we also have requirements on the cybersecurity personnel that has to be in place on each agency. So there would be someone responsible. We are carrying actively out, not only within the government, but um, on larger across the, across the whole population, kind of awareness raising. Don't share your passport, uh, password. Um, should you give a consent for your genome data for $10 uh, coupon in Amazon? You shouldn't do that. So general awareness raising and uh, basic hygiene this is where it uh, starts. We are testing out employees actively, and we are not only doing penetration testing in uh, government agencies, information systems, but also uh, we call them TT, uh, also very important uh, service providers. Banks, for instance, are one of them. So the government in this place has an extremely important role. Uh, of course, we are touching upon on uh, AI and uh, machine learning as well. So we have seen that this is another way for us to uh, identify different anomalies. We have, for security reasons as well, we have x our data exchange layer that we use within the government, but also with different private sector counterparts. So it is, just to draw it together, it is not one thing, but it is a combination of many. And uh, as a result, I guess this is just to show um, NATO Cybersecurity Center is in uh, Tallinn as well. So it is a long-term commitment, and it must come down from the government end. I, I always wondered, and I want to ask you, you know, in the financial services, um, uh, one way of supervision, it's so-called mystery shopping that uh, the supervisor comes to 
to the service provider and uh, tests whether uh, he's providing the adequate services, information, etc. Uh, is something like uh, mystery attacking or mystery cyber attacking uh, in place uh, in Estonia? So, uh, of course, we are doing stuff like that, and we are testing our uh, employees as well, sending fake phishing emails and uh, then notifying, like, you shouldn't do that from the whole organization, in this organization, from 1,000 people, 350 uh, clicked the mal uh, malfunctioning link and entered their, uh, I don't know, uh, smart ID, pin one, and so forth. So we are testing people and also systems all the time. So this is a regular thing. Thank you very much. Andre, uh, from the European perspective, are we ready for the uh, digital finance of the future uh, with respect to the cyber security? Um, I truly really hope so. Uh, but I, I, think, I think this is kind of a, a matter where it's, um, it's very difficult to be 100% ready uh, against any, any possible attacks that, that uh, come, come through. But I think it's really about uh, building uh, a res resilience in this regard. Uh, trying to make uh, put put in place uh, uh, mechanisms that will actually prevent uh, those those threats from happening, and I think uh, also fo following uh, the the previous uh, intervention, um, I think there is a number of, of measures that that we should be actually doing also from uh, the, not only the government's point of view but also from the European point of view. Um, I have been. Uh, we, we've discussed uh, the uh, ongoing discussions on the uh, on, on the current uh, financial services legislation. One of them, the Digital Operational Resilience Act, is actually uh, the one that is harmonizing and putting uh, in place rules specific for the financial uh, services providers for financial institutions uh, when it comes to um, uh, management prevention, uh, building resilience, but also reporting, testing. Uh, and dealing with uh, with the potential attacks, uh, so that the, you know there are there are rules that uh, that are actually harmonised across across the Europe, and that, and also I think uh, there's one important point, um, which is relevant not only for the financial services uh, industry. I think it's more relevant for many industries these days. Um, there's there's a, there's a sort of a, um, dependence on uh, the services provider, especially huge. Uh, uh, digital services providers, which are not uh, all of them located in, in the European Union, and I think it's, it is also to sort of make sure that the compliance with uh, with the rules are um, uh, is is actually there uh, throughout the, uh, the the supply chain. Um, we will be uh, and we are currently discussing an upgrade of uh, the uh, NIS directive, uh, which is actually uh, a common base rules for uh, for cybersecurity in, in in Europe, and also uh, recently, and I think this is an ongoing process, uh, reinforcing the capacities of uh, the European agency ENISA, which is actually in charge of of uh, cybersecurity matters. So I think I mean. Definitely, the, the current situation in Ukraine and the context uh, uh, is, is maybe calling for more urgency uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, raising readiness. Uh, but I think uh, it, it has been already an ongoing process and, and the Euro European harmonization also in regards of uh, building the digital resilience and the cyber resilience is, is there. And uh, I can only uh, agree with, uh, with the very basic rules of sort of a, you know, digital literacy uh, and digital skills uh, uh, being built uh, throughout the population because in, in many in many uh, attacks like that uh, we know that the human factor is, is an important one we can have very good system you know very robust and very resilient but it's, it's also linked to the, to the competencies of, of, um, of, of um, uh, broader public but also of the of the of the uh, relevant personnel so I think these are these are the, uh, the the let's say the focus of the actions on, on the European level but uh, it is definitely uh, an important uh, let's say policy area uh, in, in in these days just just to add I think uh, regarding resiliency what we see right now in Europe after the Ukraine uh, attack is more and more countries are now starting to think what happens if the really the worst becomes. So um, I know that in Estonia we had data embassy for quite a long time. So our most important uh, state population registry data is uh, also in Luxembourg. 
But I see that uh, we need to think about resiliency. What if the worst happens? What if um, our population registry data is either leaked or something even worse happens? So we need to think also two steps ahead, not only about cybersecurity, but what happens if everything goes bad. Yes, this is uh, quite a common approach uh, with regards to any data base, thinking of what can happen as the worst scenario. Uh, however, uh, with uh, the citizens' data, uh, it becomes more sensitive from the perspective of uh, really this would really influence, have a strong influence on the whole population. So I can imagine it's uh, not that easy. Uh, Jan, cybersecurity from your perspective. Uh, in the Czech environment, do you see it as it should uh, move forward uh, or do you think the current level makes us somehow resilient uh, uh, from, for example, the Russian threat? Well, I can, I can only comment the industry. I see it as the banking. And for the banking, you know that they are testing themselves like every six, every six months. Uh, it's quite large things like the disaster recovery testing, et cetera, et cetera. You were uh, mentioning if there are, let's say, other tests beside the penetration testing. Yes, there is. It's something we call like red teaming. Uh, that's very simple that the company pays uh, some, I wouldn't call it hacker company, but they ask him, please attack us and just find some vulnerabilities so, so we can fix them. And just imagine it's not simple that you are testing if the technical environment is okay. Now, current, if you, let's say, f uh, demand some, some kind of red teaming, the attack is targeted on the employees. Mostly on the em employees, the company are using uh, the social engineering methods just to get just to get in then and as you are in all the technical measures are out and you can do whatever you want so also now i can see that also the banks but also other companies are now more focusing on let's say protecting the employees and doing everything they can that they are let's say familiar with what can happen if something happened what they should do, what, what they should do and overall i see the banking again not sure about the other industry i think it's a not top the level, but a very high level of, let's say, cybersecurity res uh, resilience. Also, all the Czech banks are uh, in a close cooperation with the National Security Center, uh, trying to, uh, let's say, help with some kind of, not defeating the attack, but declining the attacks. And also, and coming back to my future, so helping uh, with the communication and education of the users. Because still the user will be the weakest point. Greta, do you see any opportunity with regards to current discussion on cybersecurity? I think just to add what has been uh, mentioned before in terms of digital literacy and also financial literacy, I think that is definitely a point that we're still underestimating. Just to make people aware, as Otto has said, do not hand out your personal data. Do not give people access to your personal data, um, especially in the field of financial services. Uh, do not transfer money just to someone that might be telling you, um, you know, please, please pay me, for example, on a, on a platform somewhere, but always make sure that you use safe payment methods. And in that regard, we really have to say that um, we're still missing, let's say, a, a European-wide solution for that. Um, of course, there is always, you can use intermediaries um, to pay someone. You can, for example, use your credit card and then if worse comes to worse, you're being reimbursed by your credit card company. But just, I think that that level of um, education is something that uh, business and government can still do a lot more on. And should do more. <laughs> let's, uh, let's add this. Okay. Uh, that was another question uh, I have seen uh, from the audience, and it was uh, regarding the digital currencies. I think it's uh, quite a topic now. How do you see them? Uh, how do you see them? Uh, uh, is this the future of finance, or is this just the one part, or it is already the, the past of the finance and uh, uh, it will not be used anymore? Is the Maybe the question is, is there any plan to have a single European digital currency? Has it already been raised and uh, uh, should someone uh, demand it or it would be difficult, complicated? What do you think? 
we maybe we'll do a little <laughs> survey. How many are using cryptocurrencies at least monthly? Raise your hand. Monthly. Monthly. Or once. Who has used once? So not many. But would it be helpful to have the European one? You know, can we switch? So my, my only question is, if we are going to have a European cryptocurrency, how does it differ from Euro itself? So is it just for the sake that it is digital? Then that's the case already. So why do we want to have European-wide cryptocurrency? That's my, really my main question. We, I previously um, joked as well that we once told during a conference that uh, we are going to launch uh, Estcoin. So together with our uh, e-residency, and that blew up. But on a Estonian government perspective, I can truly say we have no inspiration or aspiration to come up with our own um, cryptocurrency. So we don't see a future right now. Yes. It's actually, um, I think for the first time I hear from Estonian that uh, something digital has no future. Uh, but uh, I think, well, at, at the same time, uh, well, Est Estonia is now part of the, the, of the single currency. Um, and, and the discussion actually on the level of European central banks uh, are already quite advanced uh, in terms of, of a digital euro project. Uh, we even expect at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year a proposal from the European Commission on the legislation on, on the digital euro. It doesn't really mean that, you know, at, in, in one day it, it will appear. But I think um, as, as, I, as I followed the debates and uh, they are ongoing for a couple of years right now, uh, not only in Frankfurt, but also across, across the, the uh, single currency area, I think those are very, uh, very likely. Um, to, to quote examples from uh, non-euro countries, I think the most advanced country when it comes to introduction of a digital currency is Sweden. Uh, their their e-corona is actually um, a very very well advanced project, um, and they obviously try to will will try to uh, use it on uh, on the Swedish territory as as a start. But uh, this is something that is very closely linked to the fact that uh, basically Sweden as country and the society and economy is uh, is becoming almost perfectly cashless so that that you can see the the, the up, uh, uptake of, of the digital payments uh, in this regard but uh, obviously i think and this is this is part of the uh, ongoing investigation phase as they call it uh, in frankfurt um, they have to define the user cases for for the possibility uh, for the possible digital euro and i think uh, there is a, a sort of a consensus that uh, the digital euro it, if being introduced and, and tested should mainly at the beginning serve for the payment purposes. Um, obviously, the difference I think for the for the end user, and this is something where we have to we have to look at to what actually be the value value added of of, uh, of the digital euro. Uh, for the end user, there may be no difference for from uh, basically the electronic payments we are we are doing right now, but from the back. Um, from the back office of, of, of it, there will be a different infrastructure uh, used for, for those payments. Um, we are currently now, when we, when we use electronic payments, we are basically uniquely dealing with the commercial bank's infrastructure. Uh, for the digital euro, it will be based on, on the central bank uh, infrastructure and central bank uh, depository. So it's, it's, it's slightly different in terms of how uh, the the currency will be designed. But I think uh, in the debate that we are currently having, uh, let's say on the political level, uh, the, the so-called central bank digital currencies are being uh, used as, as one part of arguments how should, uh, let's say, the authorities and, and the public authorities react to uh, the, the increase and, and, uh, and actually the, the fast innovation and dynamics of uh, the virtual currencies which are being introduced from from the private entities. We, we have discussed for, I think, past two years, um, there has been a project which 
has not been launched in the end, but uh, was uh, backed by a number of companies, including Facebook, Uber, and others. Uh, it was called uh, Libra stablecoin, or after, after a change was a DM stablecoin, which was basically meant also as, as a largely available global uh, virtual currency that would be linked to uh, the services of some of the, some of the uh, mainly big techs, but also other, other um, the digital services providers, uh, and which would be basically a, a tokenized form of, um, of, a, of a means of payment. Uh, and that I think is, is also a trend which will inevitably uh, be, be discussed and will be, uh, will be uh, part of, of, of the innovation. So I think, um, I mean, I'm currently discussing the, the, this, this file on the markets and crypto assets. So uh, I basically, uh, I, do, I don't use the cryptocurrencies, but I basically part, uh, spent uh, um, part of my working day on uh, the issue of cryptocurrencies. And um, uh, I think there is, there is, a, huge, uh, there is a huge potential. I think we don't know where where it, where it, it would end. We see we see many very uh, uh, successful business cases being developed, but we also see uh, biggest failure. I mean, I think all of you who are f uh, following the crypto uh, trade um, and crypto exchanges uh, witnessed uh, a fast and sharp fall of, of U.S. Terra stablecoin, uh, which has basically collapsed uh, these these uh, past uh, this, basically this week. So I think uh, there's a lot of dynamic. But what we can see is, I think, mainstreaming of the virtual currency. So that it's not only um, it's not only let's say alternative and parallel projects of cryptocurrencies being introduced, but there is a more and more interest not only from fintechs but also from the, let's say the legacy financial institutions of um, you know on, on actually how to use and how to make use of, of cryptocurrencies within their traditional uh, business model they, they use and the products they they they, uh, they offer. Greta, maybe question to you. Uh, how do you see the the future of uh, digital currencies? Like, do you think uh, there's a potential for means of payment only, or for, from the perspective of speculative uh, investment asset? Uh, have you thought about it? Yeah, I think so. On the on the question of whether there will be a digital euro, I think the question is not whether, but rather when because um, as has been said, the European Central Bank is currently in its investigative phase. I think a launch has been discussed for 2024. So maybe uh, that will work, maybe it won't work, but I think it is just a matter of time, frankly. I think something that we have to really keep in mind um, is that there has to be proper integration between businesses and uh, consumer wallets. Um, that means that uh, if we're introducing it, there should be universal access to banks, to non-banks, payment service providers, third-party providers, to really make sure that we're actually matching the needs of the consumer and um, that the consumer can actually really benefit from the digital euro. To that end, um, we should probably also discussing, discuss uh, making it a legal tender to make sure that um, acceptance really has to be mandatory. And uh, yeah, also to make sure that we really have the consumer on board and make it as easy for them as possible, because that's what I think will be crucial, because we might be discussing uh, crypto or digital currencies here, but we have to keep in mind that for the average consumer, probably just the thought of having a digital euro is still something that they're very unfamiliar with. So we really have to keep them on board. Jan, do you see any perspective uh, uh, from the Check crown. Well, regarding the digital currency, I don't see it like a priority. I think this is something what will come naturally in some time, as Greta said. It's not about a, uh, let's say, how, what, when. In the future, it will come. I just see that there are simply other areas where it can help. For example, we are discussing the EU digital ID wallet. One of the comments that came from the European Banking Association was that, for example, the wallet should introduce also ability to do payments. So. For me, the focus will be now on the, for example, on the application of the AYD wallet to allow payments for, let's say, EU-wide users. The currency will not help in this. So we will see what the, the future will bring. Um, uh, but when we are speaking about the future, uh, we started with the past uh, 
what we considered uh, as a digital technology of the future a few years ago. And uh, I see that it's very strongly linked to, to mobile phones. Actually, you shouldn't be have mobile phones. It would be difficult to, to speak about digital finance. Uh, and uh, what kind of technology do you consider as necessary for uh, for the steps? Do you think it's the mobile phone and this is where we end it? Or it's, uh, it's some kind of other device that will be needed uh, in the future? So I will take from my side. Um, I think the future is going to be completely technology channel agnostic. So you don't need to rely on your phone. You can rely on any device whatsoever. So I think that's, that's the complete the beauty of it, that you are not entangled into using one concrete um, communication way. You can uh, even just, let's say in five years, maybe we are wearing uh, everyone glasses. I have one already. So all the information is here. So I really hope that we are going to less and less uh, be relying on these devices here and more we can decide how we are actually interacting. And why not in future if we have uh, different uh, cryptocurrencies actively in use that we can really have a kind of seamless communication with all different um, entities, private sector counterparts, public sector organizations from just talking to my Siri. Hey, I'm not going to say it. I would like to buy um, jeans and I will be able to order it straight away. Completely seamless, integrated way. Well, I think what needs to be changed is partially replying to the question that is, uh, that is here how we can, let's say, do something with uh, how, uh, how the safety of the financial technologies can be assured. Uh, there will be still a pressure for the mobile phone, uh, uh, let's say, developers or factories, because, for example, a UID digital wallet, it somehow needs to be assured because the user will have the data on his, on his mobile phone. And it needs to be assured that the user cannot change the data. So there's a, there must be something special in the hardware that will not allow you to change the data. Uh, that's the one thing. The second thing is the technology, for example, the, the biometrics. Now we are mostly using the finger, uh, fingerprint or the face recognition. This is something also what needs to be, what needs to be improved from the technological point of view. Uh, just giving you her example, I think you were mentioning that uh, please avoid giving your password to someone else. Uh, for the future, it will be required that there will be no passwords. There will be no usernames. Already now it's possible, but with, let's say, with enhanced biometrics, it will be more user-friendly and it will be, let's say, more secure for a common use, like uh, as, we you now, uh, as we now use, uh, for, uh, for example, internet banking application, et cetera, et cetera. So just imagine the onboarding, how you can activate the application. You need the username, you need a password, you need a confirmation SMS. Just by changing it to biometrics, it, it, will, be the, it, it will make the onboarding more seamless and also more secure. We have actually seen it with uh, COVID passports that uh, this you just have one QR code and uh, that's it, and you can use it in Czech Republic or uh, in in France with no stress. Everybody, uh, it's recognized in the whole EU, and I think this is an example that when we want to, then it can work. Just to add on the f uh, threat side. I think that's the biggest threat right now, that uh, we are unable to use biometry as an authentication. It is only valid for three-way uh, authentication. So biometry, from a cybersecurity perspective, the previous question, that's a no-go, really. Uh, using your um, eye iris, for instance, not, not a reliable way. So uh, if that perspective doesn't change, if the technology doesn't mature, uh, if we are still able to um, falsify who is actually behind it, then we are unable to make it truly seamless from a customer perspective. And maybe from the other side, what about the people who don't want to use the smart uh, devices? Andre, 
does EU think about those people? Uh, I, I'm asking because uh, at a conference uh, two days ago in Bratislava, I met a colleague uh, who's uh, the chief digital transformator of uh, one financial institution, and he does not like to use smart devices. A few years ago, he had all those devices, uh, uh, the watch, the ring, uh, mobile phone, the glasses, everything, and now he's something like on a digital detox, and he does not want to use uh, these devices. He does not use social media, and what about these people? Because with the young people, I see that a lot they are more on uh, they are still more and more on the on the digital detox. And can the digital finance or the financial technological side work for these people who don't want to follow the smart devices? That's a difficult question, actually. Um, uh, wh whether people who deny the technology can, can actually be helped by technology. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in, in this regard, we're still, we're, we're still discussing digital finance as, um, um, as complement, I mean, to, to, to many issues. So it, it doesn't really mean, definitely, there is a shift in focus, for example, from the financial institutions um, that are that, that that started their business in in complete offline world, there's a shift actually to 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 online. But it doesn't really mean that they are completely abandoning what they were doing before. Um, and I think um, this is this is also we 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 have just discussed the digital euro. Um, very interesting, actually, fact throughout the COVID, which was marked by massive digitalization of of uh, transactions. In, in countries like Germany, Czech, Czech Republic, or Austria, the, there was an increased use of cash. There's actually even higher amount of cash in, in, in circulation in those countries, compared to just the opposite way uh, of, of what happened in, in, uh, in Sweden, for instance. So I think uh, there, there is still this you know, combination of, of offline and, uh, and online. Obviously, and, and here I would definitely join our Estonian colleague, we, we really need to make sure that, uh, for instance, if, if the public services are provided online, they have to be uh, easy to use. They have to be really accessible. So even, I mean, there, because there can be part of the people who make their personal choice not to use any digital devices, I, I get that, but uh, there may be also part of the uh, population that are actually not able to, to use fully the digital, uh, digital technologies. So that I think, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to be sure that uh, uh, those, uh, those part of populations are actually also uh, taken care of. And uh, um, I, I don't know if the technology can be, can be useful for, for that, Maybe yes, if we do it friendly, user user friendly enough, then 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 definitely. But I think uh, there has to be always uh, for, for some 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 kind of services there has to be there has to be an al alternative. But uh, I think just to to have a quick comment on 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 the question you raised in terms of uh, the future, and um, I think there was, a, there was a broad discussion about this on one of the previous panels. But I think even in financial uh, services world, the internet of, internet of things. Will be uh, also the one that we completely uh, that may completely transform the the way the financial services are provided, and also I think um, the the sort of user involvement. There will be many transactions that we do now uh, with our full content that, uh, consent that we can actually um, be be outsourced to uh, some of the smart devices that will do it with our initial consent and they, they will do it automatically. Um, uh, recently I, I have seen um, a project of, of a car paying itself, uh, the, the highway toll uh, for, for its user, very, very, very seamless, very, very easy. Uh, those, those projects are being introduced as well. And I think these kind of examples will, will basically be redeveloped either throughout our glasses I agree. Good idea, um, uh, or or other devices that we are used to used to use in in, in in everyday life. Jan, what suggestions do you have to increase uh, uh, the use of uh, of digital finance or of the financial technology of the future for the people? We, we spoke about the the digital uh, digital literacy. Uh, do you see any other means on on how to increase uh, how to increase the use? Well, let's say, coming back to the point of view from, let's say, digital identity point of view and the use, I think that's a, we call it in Czech like, slepice vejce, sorry for that. 
that uh, if you have enough identities, I mean people who can use it, then there is quite a demand or a request for the firm to offer use cases for the digital IDs and vice versa. If you have a company with a lot of use cases, then there is a demand from the, let's say, client's point of view, we want to use it. And uh, this is something what needs time, and now I'm sorry for repeating myself, but again, now we are, uh, I mentioned that now we have around more than mil one million people who already use the digital, uh, digital ID. I believe that in two years it will be more than a double. But again, it's the education, it's the communications. Not, not thinking what I can add more, but uh, yes, it's education, communication, sorry. Um, what about, uh, uh, <laughs> what about, we have some questions from the audience. I'm not forgetting about them. Uh, uh, we are uh, debating them uh, uh, throughout our discussions. And we have uh, one new, aren't we too dependent on payment companies like uh, Visa or MasterCard? Maybe I, I will react think. because actually my neighbor is a representative of Visa and he keeps saying me uh, every day I'm hearing that we will be cancelled next year and I'm hearing this for the last 17 years. So uh, I don't think so that we will get rid of uh, companies like Visa and Mastercard and, uh, and by the way I'm happy that uh, we have companies like that because by the way like Visa and Mastercard just look at how many innovation they brought in the financial world in the in the let's say in our life so not saying that uh, that is good that we have only like two competitors and i think uh, european union make a lot of attempts how to get rid of mastercard on visa or at least uh, how to get rid of the let's say almost mono mono monopoly uh, i can i can see that also in the future there will be a use for both companies because it's the same like if there are uh, people who are simply declining the use of the smartphone i think there will be people declining the use of some kind of virtual card so there will be still people who will be willing to pay with card, I mean with a physical, a physical card. So yes, I think there, there will be still a place for both companies in the future ecosystem. Even there will be a digital currency. Greta, do you see uh, s um, new competitors or the serious big competitors uh, rising uh, for the payment uh, systems? Well, I will say that, of course, Visa and MasterCard are in a quite in a good position just looking at how long they've been in the market. Um, I think what we can definitely work on is to create a level playing field to encourage new and maybe also smaller players to um, take on the market and to get more innovative solutions in general. But that doesn't just apply to Visa or MasterCard. That essentially implies to all bigger incumbents that we also give new players a chance how the competition can be increased in all the fields of, uh, of uh, digital finance? I think one of the things that we briefly discussed as well, we need to, and this is also how we strengthen the FinTech uh, part, is about digital inclusion. So if we are thinking about people who are not willing to use, I'm just going to bring you an anecdotal story. So last year we received funding for real-time subtitling. We made the development and we also offered big companies funding to implement it. And one of the large companies said that, um, yes, that's great that you have these solutions developed and you're providing funding, but they are not our customer segment. And now my question is, is people with, um, hearing impairments or uh, visual impairments, not your customer segment. It sends out across the society really wrong message. Of course, we are talking in Estonia, for instance, we have uh, roughly 4,000 uh, people who are completely blind, but at the same time, they are still should be your customers. So I'm just going to say that we need to think more in terms also about service design and the smaller players, they are more adaptive. Um, lucky for us, we have quite many large and uh, even one FinTech unicorn wise. So there is still a lot of market to take over from uh, MasterCard, Visa and other major banks. And maybe something also to add is, you know, we're, we're so used to back in the day when you would just go to your bank and 
have someone essentially give you something for your investment, for your bank account, etc. But I think what people are more and more demanding is to essentially have the service from the best provider in class. And I think that is something where fintech can really bring in, bring in value because we're seeing an increasing fragmentation of the value chain where you're no longer going to, to a one-size-fits-all solution, but where you really want to, for example, do your investment with a provider that fits just your needs or do banking with a bank that fits just your needs. Maybe you're doing instant payments with another, another provider, and I think that is a trend that will definitely continue. Uh, our panel is called Financial Technology of the Future, and uh, as I have a two-year-old daughter, I'm always thinking of what can I do to make the future better for her, for her generation, for, for uh, young girls, young boys, for all the people? Uh, and uh, I'm coming uh, to the end of, uh, of our panel, and this is my last question for you. What step can be done uh, in the perspective of uh, financial technology, digital finance, that would make our future better or brighter. Andre? Okay, I, I, I can try start. Uh, no, I think I, I think I will I will uh, come back to, to to what I was saying when we when uh, we were discussing the regulation, uh, because I think that's that's where I can contribute at this point uh, um, uh, and in, in my capacity. But I think it's it's really. Uh, when we look at the field of, of, uh, of uh, especially digital financial services, I think, I think we have to be really cautious in terms of how we uh, set the regulatory framework, how we set it right. I think the key in, in that area, at least from my point of view, is actually to make sure that there are same rules applying all over the EU. So there is actually a huge innovative potential that is, that is already existing, so that, this, you know, uh, that we fully tap into this potential. We, we allow uh, companies to grow cross-border on the entire market. Um, we give them the, you know, the assurance and, and the stability and the predictability they, they need. Um, and uh, uh, we actually make sure that uh, this, this, is, this is something that helps them uh, to grow. And I think that's, uh, that, that should be, that should be our, our common, common goal, make, make sure that the innovative uh, potential that is actually in Europe, and, I, and, I, and we see it, we see it all, all over, all over the, uh, the EU, that, uh, that this, this, uh, this uh, potential is, is fully developed. It's not somehow uh, limited or restricted by, by uh, too, 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 too many rules, by the rules that are actually contradicting each other uh, or something like that that we can see already now in, 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 the, in, the, in the sector and actually that, that uh, this, uh, this entire area of, of not only digital financial services but the digitalization in general uh, can, can grow fast. Anyone wants to add something? I think it's putting the customer first. I think we're coming from a world where the customer had to understand finances but I think for now it's up to financial institutions to understand what the customer wants and needs and also to be as transparent as, as, and as customer friendly as possible. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. And just to final uh, comment from my side, practical cooperation, I guess this is something that we covered today and to keeping the customer throughout the line, so throughout his service line from private sector to government. I will adjust two things. Uh, very practical. First is the successful implementation of the UID wallet, because I consider it like a really infrastructure tool that uh, then everyone will be able to use or will have a tool to exist in the digital world. And the second thing, and that's for the government to, to start with more digital friendly legislation. Again, now more, as we see the laws, they are not so, let's say, digital friendly. So I think this is the other that, that can definitely help but not only the financial area, it will have definitely all the areas. Yes, first thing first, and uh, for the digital finance, it's definitely uh, the customer that should come first. So I think this is a nice conclusion for our panel. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, with their uh, great ideas. 
which I hope will be implemented thanks to the audience that you stay with us uh, for the whole panel. And uh, we look forward to some further discussions uh, later today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the panel and also to the fantastic moderator, Jana Brudani. Thank you very much. Uh, I will switch into Czech again. I hope that you stayed with us uh, also online. And I hope that you are enjoying it. Don't be afraid. Soon there will be networking and you will be able to exchange your business cards and have a glass of wine. But before that, we'll have the next panel. And the reason why I was looking for the jingle was uh, the wonderful depiction of uh, robotization and cars. Um, we will talk about e-mobility, which is an interesting topic, smart e-mobility for the 21st century not only fast and reliable, but also smart, environmentally friendly, affordable, or multimodal. This is only a fraction of the attributes that are increasingly associated with modern transport of the 21st century. There are even more attributes, and we have wonderful guests, and they will be introduced by Zdeněk Petzl, Executive Director of the Automotive Industry Association. Welcome, Zdeněk. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome those of you who are with us here and those of you who joined us online. So mobility for the 21st century, but what should it be like? There are many words that can be used and actually it tells us there are e extreme demands um, laid on uh, transportation. Europe wants to be without emission uh, in 2050, but for transport we talk about 2035, and that means earlier. For 2035 we talk about emission-free passenger cars. Uh, the main topic is e-mobility, um, and that's the buzzword, uh, but uh, there are many other words, such as uh, autonomous or digitized, and how these attributes are going to impact transport in our lives, and how the companies would need to adapt and what the regulator is going to tell will be discussed by our panelists. And I would like to welcome them here. The first is Marek Novak, who is the member of the parliament and chairman of the subcommittee on ICT telecommunications and digital economy. Welcome. Take your seat, please. The next speaker would be Natasha Oberman. Head of Online Customer Journey at Škoda Auto, Czech Republic. Welcome. Then Pia Berglund, Global Director of Regulatory Affairs and Right from Sweden. And uh, Martin Rus, Managing Director, Austria Tech, an organization established uh, by the Austrian Environmental Ministry. Welcome. It is an international panel, so we'll switch between Czech and English. Uh, hopefully, it will work. We have about an hour and a bit for the discussion. And then Maciej Gies uh, from the Polish Motor Institute uh, will um, share with us uh, the activities to support uh, e-mobility. Any time during this panel, you could use Slido and ask your questions. Uh, you can also see the QR code that can be used and also the password. And uh, to start with, um, 
we will ask the panelists how they see this topic, how the companies see it. I will ask uh, first uh, Martin Ross. And namely Austriatech uh, doing for better functioning of e-mobility ecosystems and also what are visions for implementation of autonomous driving. Please in five minutes uh, if possible. One. Five minutes for explaining the world. Oh, um, where do I start? I start with what is AustriaTech? AustriaTech, uh, as mentioned, is a federal agency owned by the Ministry of Climate Action in Austria. And we are a support facility, so to say, to implement uh, new policies, especially in transport, but not only in transport and mobility, also around transport and mobility, because as digitalization, transport is not stopping in front of sector borders. I think this is our mindset. So, of course, in always searching for the meaning and the purpose of new technology. So, I think we are taking care as an agency on digital transformation and acting as a kind of a competence center, especially for the public sector. But also we work closely with, uh, with industry players and industry networks because without any value created and without any sustainable business, no sustainable transport. It's, it's it, quite an easy equation. And of course, as, as Stenek mentioned, e-mobility should be in the center here, and I put it in the center also of, of one of our pillars on what we do and how we work. We are a national contact point for e-mobility in, in Austria and support, of course, the ministry's policy and help the ministry in developing hopefully good policies and effective policies. And there's a strong policy on e-mobility or decarbonization actually in Austria where we get, of course, we want to get climate neutral by 2040 in general. And this means e-mobility has to be really effective uh, in, in a wide, let's say, usage by at least 2030. That means um, by 2025, our share of, electric, of the electric fleet has to raise dramatically. Yeah, this, I think this is clear. And of course, we focus a little bit on the passenger mobility today, but also for freight, we have clear targets. So for, for heavy freight, for instance, also we say 2032, decarbonized heavy freight. Um, and for passenger cars, but this is more driven by the market, of course, by 2030. But, but it's not just the fleet, it's the charging infrastructure. And there, for instance, this is the next smart tool you need. It's not just about the amount of charging points or ultra-fast chargers or whatever, it's where to locate them and how to place them, that people reach them in fulfilling their mobility purposes in the right way. And just rolling out public infrastructure without knowing what people do in their private homes also makes no sense. So we, get, we need the data. This is why we need digitalization also, to get the evidence on how to steer effective measures and, and, and interventions. But the next thing then, the amount of the vehicles, it's just not enough. It's how to use our assets. So to steer the fleets, to use automation, to operate those fleets, because we have to get much smarter, not just for each single vehicle. It comes then to the customers and users. We have to use these, let's say, assets a little bit better together, so to say. Otherwise, it won't work. So we have to use, of course, better steering mechanism, traffic management, mobility management. But the core thing then for putting all these things together, so automation, sharing, ITS, traffic management, is also this outreach then towards other sectors. Uh, all the corporates, because all the employers, what they do with regard to corporate mobility for their employees, for instance. I think this is a key. Not just the corporate car, but introducing corporate mobility. Same for Austria, you all know us, your lake, our lakes, our nice alpine destinations. But also there, with working together with the tourist sector to deploy high quality services, including mobility in the future. But of course, the transport sector has to get ready to work with the digital champions in tourism. But the purpose drives mobility, 
especially if we use digitalization in the right way. Martin, thank you. Uh, you touched upon quite a lot of, uh, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you have mentioned the main uh, topics, uh, decarbonization, uh, the need to deploy infrastructure for alternative fuels, which is not uh, easy. And uh, one of the uh, hot topic is whether we work with emissions or with the number of vehicles and how vehicles are used in a city. So these are the topics that we uh, might be discussing today. Natasha. Before you tell us about activities of Škoda Auto in this area, I believe that uh, many of our attendees uh, uh, would like to hear what does it mean, head of online customer journey. I will be happy to explain it. So far, the dealer and the showroom has been the center of our business. Now, the customer center rather online and my task is to map the customer journey the customer experience and make sure that the customer experience is absolutely smooth so that the customer can have all the information that they need whenever they need it when they consider buying a new car or servicing the car so this is the task of our part of the business to make sure that the customer has everything that they need and uh, when they need it and of course to opt for Škoda. Perhaps you could mention certain specific particular activities that you do in this respect that uh, Škoda Auto is preparing for the new digital era. We are building upon the fundaments that we already have in place. That's car configurator and the website. We have different portals where the customers can find the information about the use of their vehicle. But of course, uh, the whole agenda is uh, gradually moving to the connectivity area. So the customer's vehicle can be connected 24 hours, seven days a week uh, into an application which monitors whether the vehicle is locked or not, where the car is going, a journey can be planned, a route can be planned in advance. So we try to uh, design and develop the infrastructure for the car, for the customer, and everything that the customer does with the vehicle. For example, uh, we have uh, a new functionality now which enables the customer to initiate a parking transaction pay directly from the vehicle and then just lock the vehicle and go and the parking fee is paid natasha thank you uh, we have already talked uh, in the foyer why should a customer uh, make the payment for a parking space himself or herself, if the car can do that itself. Uh, perhaps Pia Berglund could. What is your vision of uh, change, of transformation, of uh, transportation chains? Uh, basically, there has been quite a lot of discussion about autonomous mobility, which is, uh, from my understanding, one of your key pillars. But. Uh, the discussion has been sort of uh, slowing down and it seems that uh, the autonomous mobility will become uh, similar to uh, this uh, nuclear fusion, uh, the, the, the big uh, source of uh, energy for humankind that is uh, said to be always 10 years away. So is it the same for autonomous mobility? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, not at least for my company. So uh, I asked to have a picture here because I think it's easier when you see what we are doing. So I come from Enride, a Swedish startup. It's the fastest growing startup company in Sweden, and that says a lot. In the square kilometers of Stockholm, where we are located, is the most dense startup community in the world. Uh, so to tell you what we're doing, I need to tell you where we started. So six years ago, so this is uh, 
not 10 years, we don't need 10 years. Uh, our founder, an engineer from Gothenburg, came from the automotive industry and said to himself, like, will we decarbonize the transport sector? Are we doing it fast enough? So he said he didn't believe so. So he actually stopped and took some people with him and said, if we would start over and build a new transport system from the core beginning, and we would start with digitalization, not put it as a feature on the top, and we would look, how would that look like? And then if you add digitalization, electrification, atomization, and you would start over, what would that look like? And that is what is on the picture. This is uh, our innovation, and Rod Pod is autonomous. As you can see, it has no ca uh, cabin for the driver. So it's a driverless, of course, driverless vehicle. It's all electric, and I think the electric part is the most important part here. It's, it looks very futuristic, and that's nice. But it's, it's a fossil-free uh, transport, and that is what we offer customer. So what we do today, and then you have connected and digital. And so what we actually offer is that we swap the whole system. We are an IT company, so we sell transport as a service, as Spotify sell music as a service to our customers. So we join with uh, customers as partners to transform to climate neutral transportation by using big data. So in the center of all this, we have our brain, Saga, our name is, that look at exactly what you were trying to say with the assets. How can we use all the assets better? How can we plan it better? Because we know today, if we would stop here in Prague, all the transportation is maybe not even half full. And so then if you put up a charger, use money for that, you need to ensure that the charger is used fully. So what we do with this is that if you plan it better, this is not magic, this is not rocket science, this is quite easy to do if you use big data, you would end up with a very efficient system that is so much better than, than the old analog fossil system that we have today. But so I think something you need to keep in mind, we've done this with customer autonomous since uh, 2019. And also we have now the biggest electric fleet in Europe uh, with manned electric tracks. So we have quite a lot of data and, and competence on this. That we, what we know is that it's another system. So when, for example, regulator asks us, so what, how many charging points do you want to have? And they always sort of take, okay, this is how the traffic is today. So I guess we put them here. No, 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 no. Let's use the big data to tell you where you should put them in the future, in the new transport system. So I totally agree with you that big data should be used as a tool to plan the future, because the future looks different. And I love the panel before me, because usually we are the futuristic people, <laughs> because they talked about having the bank and the glasses. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm much more conservative here, just having an autonomous truck. So <laughs> that's, that's good. But So it's not science fiction, but as you said, is this 10 years away? No, we don't believe so. Uh, but I think when you use digitalization, you should come back to the benefits of it. Uh, and so we are quite keen on, you should benefit all the conditions of UN development goals and the drivers, the social conditions, as well as climate. And I think, I think that's the trick of it. When, when you use digitalization to benefit all, then there's no one against. So I think that's the trick. So, so you shouldn't benefit us, or we should, of course, do the planet better by using our resources better and the planet better and having green energy. And uh, so this is not magic, it's just being very careful. And uh, just to end, uh, we also work with some of the biggest brands work with us. Uh, the, the clients are the customers that we work with. They want to decarbonize and that's quite difficult. So we say, okay, come with us and we will help you on that journey. So we call us a transformation company as well. That, uh, but you, you, you need to have another mindset. I think that's the most important thing. So I think I stop there. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Thank you. So autonomous mobility in 2021 is a reality in uh, transportation of goods, uh, perhaps not um, in case of transportation of passengers or people. Now brief response by Marek Novak. When you heard about all these visions 
and practical implementation, what is going on abroad. Uh, are we here in the Czech Republic ready for that? Do we have skilled people and businesses? And also, do we have appropriate regulation? Do we need to change something? Thank you. It's a good question. The title of the panel is Smart E-Mobility. Well, first of all, there should be smart people. For me, E-Mobility and autonomous systems, it all means innovations. And sometimes we try to regulate innovations before actually innovations appear, but it's not possible. First, innovation should come and then regulation, as it was the case in the first three industrial revolutions. And we changed that uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. But if I look at regulation as such, it's uh, good that we can agree within the EU, then perhaps we are not that good at transposing it in individual member states. And as for the Czech Republic, we are not quite ready from the legislation point of view, and we are not uh, focusing on that. Well, the legislators should first of all think about health and safety of its inhabitants. And if I connect it with uh, smart e-mobility and autonomous driving, there are many questions coming up to my mind. And we do not regulate anything yet, but we do not have clear rules. And as everything is digital, We talk about data transfers, and the question is whether we have sufficient infrastructure, not only coverage, but also capacity. And are we able to collect data and analyze data? And we need to have also smart roads and smart people, not only smart vehicles. And we also need to teach people how to behave in a smart way and perhaps uh, start using other means of transport than uh, passenger cars. Thank you. Uh, it seems that uh, there is still a lot of work ahead of us. You mentioned smart infrastructure. You probably know the highway between Prague and uh, Brno. Um, uh, the lines are not uh, actually um, everywhere. That uh, and these are um, uh, important for smart vehicles. In Austria, um, where are you currently? Uh, what do you think are the topics? Do we need to do something for the customers uh, to make the customer journey better? Uh, be like Tesla, um, so that you come to um, a charging station, we just plug it in and don't take care of anything else? Or are we doing enough? Or is it all about only the subsidies that uh, the member states are uh, providing these days? I think I, be, I, I love every electric vehicle, first of all. I, I, I don't care so much about the brand. I use Tesla, I use Volkswagen, I use Skoda. So I think it's, that's fine with me, it's the first thing. No, and we are not doing enough. And, and the things we are doing, sometimes we are not effective enough. Of course, you might know in Austria, like in many other countries, that try to be on the forefront on, on promoting electric mobility, I think, as in Germany, for instance, we have a quite a, a good funding regime for for private use, but also for companies. And, but this is, of course, not effective because it's the funding is not going to the people that really need it. 
Yeah? And in the end, we have to collect and start with, with, with using all the data, data to getting smarter on how immobility is used yeah? and where I think uh, do we have the problems and what are facts and what are myths about immobility because uh, still people come and they arrange anxious, so to say. It's like there's no need for. You can go as long as to the next coffee stop, that's for sure. And I think this is the most important thing because you have to do a break anyhow because this is smart way of driving, for instance. But this is you, what you have to communicate. There's another thing on, I think, especially in days like this, on price transparency. Yeah? So how much will it cost? If we still um, charge or no, pay for the time we use a charger and not for the kilowatts we get out of it, then it's, it's, that's not smart. Uh, I think this is what we, we argue, for instance, in many countries with these tiny little, little gritty de nitty gritty details. And I think there's a strong need to overcome this, to get smarter and to promote it. And this is also a thing why we think in Austria, and this is, will be one of the duties of our agency in the future, to be really a kind of a, a knowledge center for e-mobility, to reach out towards the citizens, customers, to help the municipalities, to help the cities, because in the end, of course, we don't have enough brain power, so to say. We need really, really trained and high competent people, and if you need them or aim to have them in every municipality, this will not just work. You have to join forces to do that. And there's, I think, also a need to join forces between the public sector and the private sector much stronger. And I think we are, we are not so bad at this, I think, but, but when looking, for instance, to Sweden or to Finland, they are much smarter than we are, especially in Austria or Czech Republic and Germany when doing this. I think there you have to be open and frank on that. But I think it's, the vehicle itself is also pointed out, it's, it, this, is, this is one part of the equation. And I think we have to look into our mobility ecosystem and where it's smart, where we promote active mobility, where we promote sharing, where we promote public transport. And I think there is also, I think, when I look to Czech Republic, I think you're, you have smart guys and, and people here and, and, and doing smart things. Yeah? As, as in Austria, sometimes we are not smart enough to put the things together in the right way. Yeah? But I think there, this is maybe, maybe in total a, a little bit the same culture that we have, where we can learn from others and we, should, we have to learn fast on that. You mentioned smart people in the Czech Republic. Uh, yes, uh, that needs to be uh, discussed and resolved globally. So we should not invent our local solutions, but we should join the efforts. I just want to remind you that you can ask questions by using Slido. And I see the first question that looks at the situation uh, from a strategic point of view. Well, the e-mobility development and the threat uh, by the current situation, uh, meaning war in Ukraine, uh, the energy crisis, growing prices uh, of uh, electricity. Martin, uh, would you please uh, respond? Uh, do you have a recipe for that in Austria? Because uh, when I look at the latest statistical data, uh, then it's uh, Tesla uh, that is winning. So uh, I guess Austria sees it in a very optimistic way. That because. Ano, jsme optimisté a myslím si, že je to proto, že nemáme jinou alternativu. Pokud bychom nebyli optimističtí. Já si myslím, že s ohledem i na čipový hladomor stará 
auta bychom měli poslat k ledu. Samozřejmě, že především by to mělo být ve formě kombinace s veřejnou dopravou a obecně s dekarbonizací. S ohledem na ceny energií, tak u těch nabíjecích stanic prozatím ty ceny jsou stále, prozatím asi od podzimu už to bude jinak. Nicméně budeme se muset dívat na celkové náklady, celoživotní náklady na pořízení vozidel a provozování vozidel. Myslím si, že když to vezmeme z tohoto úhlu pohledu, tak ten výsledek bude daleko pozitivnější pro e-mobilitu. Rakousko se svým energetickým mixem má oproti třeba jiným zemím složitější situaci. Pochopitelně, že máme za cíl dosáhnout klimaticky neutrální výroby energie, ale podobně jako vy, máme potíž s dodávkami plynu a pochopitelně i ropy. A, a týkají se nás vysoké ceny energie. To znamená, že bychom se měli snažit motivovat a, lidi k tomu, aby používali energeticky co nejefektivnější způsob přesunování z místa na místo. Thank you, Martin. In your last sentence, you mentioned the uh, price of transportation. Uh, Pia, must, this might be uh, a question to you. How are you successful in explaining to your clients that your solution, which I assume is not exactly cheap, uh, what are the benefits and when does it make sense to use such a car? I think it's a good start to start with, we start with the customers that have decided to decarbonize. Some of the biggest brands, so Lidl is one of them, for example, that they can decarbonize all the transports in Stockholm. Uh, so they want to do it, and they know it's difficult to do it, so that's why they choose to go with us. And of course, there is a price issue, uh, but we know by doing it smarter and having this other new transport system that is digital, electric, and maybe autonomous, but sometimes manned, Uh, we know we can do it at maybe or even cost parity before the crisis that is because now you don't know where the prices is going uh, but it's by using uh, the track so uh, because I still we have to recognize that the transport sector haven't been in a good sector sustainable we have low salaries we have drivers sleeping in the cars we have low prices it's a low margin business not even like one percent so uh, If you take a look at that and say, what, what if, so we are a what if company, so what if we can utilize this like 90% full cars? The charger we have with Lidl in Stockholm is the most used charger in Europe. And that is not because we drive more, it's because we use it better. And then you get the price down on that, you get the price down on the battery. So, you, so by being very careful, and what actually I do have, uh, that's why I like the customer journey, what actually happens is that when you plan it better, you get a better quality. So we deliver on a 98% quality of the product. So then you're talking money here, that you get actually a better product that is carbon free, maybe cost parity or a bit higher, but you get a better product. So I think there's, We have to recognize that some part of, especially the European goods market, is not sustainable in all those uh, areas. So I think for us it has not been an issue. But I think that the trick is to start, you know, not to take all the cherries on the cake, to cherry pick. So of course, I, we, Sweden is the lo one of the longest countries in, in Europe. So if I would say, let's start with Lapland. There is no charger there. There's a lot of electricity, but there's no charger. So by cherry picking, we can do 70% almost with all customers tomorrow, always, by cherry picking. So I think that's one point, to use the data to say, where do we start? Where, what is easy to do? What can we do tomorrow? What can we do in five years and 10 years? So I think that kind of analysis 
is rarely discussed. I think the opponents usually take that road in Lapland, say, but that won't never work. No, 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 of course, I agree with you. Let's take that one last. Because uh, at least in Sweden, the target is to decarbonize 70% by 2030. And that's not even eight years away. So we better start working. And that's the, what we are doing. So maybe if someone don't want to work, fine for us. But <laughs> we can take 100% then. Uh, so, that, that's, so I think that's the trick, to, 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 to look where you are, start easy, find your friends, collaborate. We collaborate with uh, the government as well as the researchers. And because uh, difficult questions require great minds and, and, and collaborations. So I, I think that's the trick, uh, not to make it too difficult. So if you have a road that doesn't fit, don't pick that one. Pick another one. <laughs> that would be my advice. Dobrá zpráva asi v tom smyslu, že... Well, the good news is that in 2022, e-mobility is not mandatory everywhere, even though some countries have set a goal to go completely e-mobile by 2030. Uh, what impact will this have uh, on passenger cars? Of, of course, in freight, uh, transport, uh, the operators are used to calculating total ownership costs or lifelong costs. Uh, but with passenger cars, it's difficult. Um, so what is the viewpoint of uh, Škoda? I'm not sure I understand your question correctly, but uh, in uh, our industry, when we hand over the car, it's uh, an individual act and there is a lot of emotion involved. And today we are trying to uh, hand over the whole ecosystem of the customer experience with uh, the old fashioned uh, conventional cars, combustion engine cars, it was the engine that played the major role. Today, it's more the charging stations where uh, and the uh, distribution of the charging uh, stations, charging points, and uh, planning the route from the comfort of the home. So we are extending the product with the whole ecosystem. You mentioned that today's customer uh, is moving elsewhere and the, the requirements from the car are different than there used to be. The customers require better infotainment, better interconnection between the vehicle and the private life. How easy or difficult is it for your uh, company, which you are a sort of a legacy? A business. Uh, so, how successful have you been with your customer journey? I understand that you may have complaints by customers, for example, that voice recognition does not work perfectly. So, what do you do? How do you approach uh, these uh, things? Uh, you probably cannot restructure. Well. I uh, like uh, the idea of, you know, Pia said that uh, they are a startup. It doesn't work for us. But we decided that we want and can open new departments and do things in a new way. So we stand behind our product, uh, the vehicle, but we are being transformed into a software company because in today's vehicle software, uh, plays uh, an important part also with respect to customers. Uh, so we try to respond in an innovative and agile way. So we um, establish also our um, daughter companies and um, we also uh, try to transform ourselves. So we take it seriously, and both uh, Škoda and Volkswagen 
sees uh, its role in contributing to fulfillment of the goals uh, and in reduction emissions by 2050. And this is uh, what we do and this is what we focus uh, on every single day in our two uh, main objectives are digitization of internal processes, but also of the processes uh, for the um, vehicles and also clean mobility. Uh, now, I would like to go to yet another topic, and that is autonomous uh, mobility, a topic presented by uh, Pia Berglund. How to imagine that being users? Um, how does it work if such an autonomous vehicle is actually part of the traffic? Uh, you mentioned several times, you know, for example, police wants to stop such an autonomous vehicle. Could you please um, describe um, your idea about the future of the traffic? I'm a lawyer by training, so just a short background. Uh, since we don't have any UN standard yet and no EU legislation yet, there's no country that has perfect legislation. Many countries have test legislation, so you can drive under those, and we have been doing that then for a few years. And so, of course, in that we work with, uh, for example, uh, fire brigade, police brigade as well. They are included in our, our discussions, and that I think will happen in many countries. I think Germany is looking at the same. So when we apply for a permit to drive on a public road in a city, we engage with them early on, as well as the municipality. They are they have to approve to go do that, and I think that's great. But that, of course, there is a worry, and and the question we get, for example, from the police officers is like, how can we engage? And I think this is a mindset question. We are trying to be polite when we reply. But what actually it tells me is that they have not reflected on that they will not have to drive around in a police car. They will be autonomous. They will be sitting in a control tower together with us. <laughs> so, so I think it's a mindset also of authorities thinking like, why should you drive around in a car? These are computers driving. There, there's no one to speak to. So, but of course I don't, can't reply that. So my official reply is that we do have remote centers. We do have remote operators with people. That's an important part of our solution. Uh, because you have to check that the security is loaded safely. You have to maybe speak that is uh, to someone, someone. You have to speak to maybe the policeman. So we always have an operator in charge uh, that you can actually speak to. But I think it's a mindset that, because something we, we have reflected on as an actual industry in Sweden, not just us, is that can you imagine all the benefits of this? If, if you have connected vehicle, independent if it's a private cars or trucks, and you can send out signal to it, like uh, there's an ambulance coming at the high speed and the left uh, keep out, or there will be a traffic jam over here, everybody take right. Because these are our computers, and that can happen even now, I think, with drivers in the cars. But I think, I think we need to start to see how we can actually benefit from it. And because often we get the question of all the difficulties, like cybersecurity and stopping it, but there are so many benefits, and I think the, the quicker we jump into that part, uh, the more sort of uh, you will understand it, and then we can together solve those difficulties. So, for example, there is a discussion: should we have a mic so you can actually speak into the car, so that will end up in a remote station? That's something we can discuss, uh, of course, uh, or a telephone number that you can phone and there's someone an answer. Uh, but I don't know. There's a YouTube clip actually going around the world now on on the police trying to stop a car in San Francisco just about this. Uh, so. But legally, the legislation is clear what we should do. So, but I think, so I think it's much more of a mindset that you think that I will do my job the exactly same way in 20 years ahead. No, you will not. <laughs> so, so you will probably send out a signal and ask the car, so sorry, but where are you going? And they will get the signal back saying, like, I'm going over here. Great. So can I ask you what kind of cargo do you have? So this is, of course, the future. So, but but we are not there yet, so that's the discussion we are having. Sorry for a long answer. Also something to add, an, an old quote of an old American friend who said, something everywhere, everything somewhere. And I think this remains for automation. 
and because you have a very, very differentiated landscape of products and services, transporting people with high speed, with low speed, transporting packages, getting things done. Yeah? So productivity, uh, for instance, uh, garbage collection, the nice tests there over from Volvo in Sweden. And I think you see there's a lot of productivity gains today. The thing is, we have to orchestrate and organize the way we manage traffic in a different way, if we want to do it right. So it's not just the vehicles organizing themselves. No, there's, there's something there taking care. Yeah? And so our traffic management centers, uh, they have to do different things that just on the macro level is, is everything somehow good? No, you have to go into detail. What's happening on this ramp? And what's the advice for the vehicles coming? And is it really so heavily, heavy fool on, on, on the road that you need to orchestrate to say, okay, now we intervene or we just let it flow because it works. Yeah? Because otherwise I think this kind of magic all will thing, I think this will not happen. I think because not even I think in 50 years, but I think dedicated services for dedicated purposes on dedicated roads and, and th th then we can sort things out, but still we, we're doing a lot of mess also in the, in the whole, let's say, automation ecosystem, so to say, in Europe, on, on putting all the things together in one basket. And then uh, we are somehow astonished that people are getting confused about automation. So Pia mentioned that uh, not only there is a new technology coming to the world and that we will move in different way, but there will be different ways of interactions. And I want to ask Martin, you, how does a representative of an entity related to the state, how does Austria seize the main point? either regulatory or practical, what we need to do and what the Czech Republic should take away as a task that needs to be done. Should we focus on that also on a European level in a more wide perspective? So you mean especially towards automation or...? or Attack. Um, uh, she, uh, Pia talked about uh, the, the practice, the reality of automation, uh, bringing into life. Actually, you are representing the state, so yeah. what is your point of view? Uh, what is awaiting us? What do we need to do to make all this happen and, uh, in reality? I think it's collaboration and learning and forming strategic alliances. This is actually something we are, we are actually doing also in Austria. I think we now have, we are on the final phase now of, of implementing our second so-called action plan. We started back in 2017 with the first measures from the government, but not, but was it maybe driven by the government, but not just the government alone. And of course, testing regulation, something. But the second, what we did is um, test environments as really kind of common learning environments where we learn in the field, in practice. A lot of research funding also nationally that, that led us to, I think, a situation also on European level that Austria is per capita, the country with, let's say, we, we have been most successful, even successful in Sweden, <laughs> in all those funding programs on how we participate because we, we backed our national players from industry and research side to do that because it's learning, learning, and learning. We are in the beginning, and it's, it's all about collaboration and learn from each other. This is also, for instance, the reason why we as an agency are partner in Drive Sweden, because we want to learn there. And I think this is, this is the way on how we engage as a governmental body. But we, of course, we are also a national contact point for automated driving. So when everybody wants to test on open roads, they apply at our agency, and then I think we're doing the whole permit stuff together with the ministry. I think you need those processes quite agile and not always discuss three years about how to change the, the practical processes. And there I think this is, this is one thing, yes, 
certain discussions are needed on European level, but I think you have to reflect on what are the competences and the structures nationally and to build certain things nationally. Because what people have in Sweden on structures won't work in Austria, maybe vice versa. <coughs> So it is obvious that you are preparing regulatory framework in the Czech Republic. This is currently being done at the Ministry of Transport. Uh, currently, the proposal or design of the law on autonomous vehicles operation is uh, on the table uh, because some vehicles are at least tested on motorways, so regulation or legislation will be highly desirable. Uh, Marek, uh, you as the representative of the executive force, what is your perception? Do you see it as a positive thing or do you think there are still too many uh, issues outstanding uh, in the field of safety, uh, security? I see it as a good thing that the Ministry of Transport is preparing the design of a law. And from this moment up to the actual act, there is a long journey. And particularly in case of autonomous mobility, e-mobility, smart mobility, the journey will be even longer because it requires a great uh, deal of communication and collaboration. You need to address uh, safety and security issues, uh, liability issues, and many others. And you want to design the law in such a way that no major amendments or updates are needed. And first of all, you have to consult uh, the experts and both from uh, among the manufacturers and technology providers. And without that, you cannot design a good law. When talking about the autonomy of uh, vehicles, I wanted to ask Natasha. Uh, Škoda has not announced a non-autonomous vehicle so far, although it might be uh, expected. So what are the novelties that you are currently preparing for your uh, customers in terms of connectivity with the vehicle? Well, I will keep to the models that are available today. We are definitely planning to extend and expand the range of uh, electrical vehicles, the, the range should be much wider, also price-wise. And apart from that, we are considering how to make better use of the smartness of the vehicle. We work on location-based offers. This means that using the connectivity and the vehicle knowing whether uh, customer the driver is, we, uh, the, the screen in the vehicle can display interesting offers by partners who are connected to the system, like, for example, a petrol station or uh, a fast food chain or so. So this is one of the novelties. So we are Again, merging the needs of the customers and the data we have available from the vehicle with what the customer might need or want to use. By the end of the year, it should be possible to uh, enable uh, parking, a payment for parking directly by, from the car by the car. There is another pilot in Prague. Uh, and that's uh, delivery to the car. So we are cooperating with the uh, packety service. And um, uh, this should be uh, connected with remote unlocking and locking of the vehicle. So the uh, messenger should be able to 
approach the car, the car will be unlocked remotely, the messenger leaves the package uh, in the car, and then the car gets locked again remotely. So these are the uh, simply clever touch the items and bits and pieces. Uh, well, the delivery could be done by uh, the uh, autonomous vehicles that Pia designed. Uh, Pia, do you look even further? Do you consider what this can mean for the labor market? How will this impact the drivers or other people who find their employment today in transport? How will this impact the market? Uh, so, if you work with heavy trucks as we do, I mean, safety is, of course, core. Even if there wouldn't be that kind of legislation, I mean, because that's important for us and for, the, for our customers. So that's, of course, clear. And to us, that means to have a human intervention always. We are at that stage that we want to have that, whether it's compulsory or not. So what we have is remote operation stations. And the requirement is quite set already in many countries. You have to have a truck driving license on that. So it's more like a, a tower where you can operate a monitor, but you still have a license of a truck driver. And what we can see, and we hired the first one in the US, the truck drivers, the remote operated truck drivers, it's, it's, it's a much better climate. You can go home, you sleep in your bed, and, and you have working hours. And so there are so many benefits. So even I would say when the autonomous legal proposal came out in Sweden, the unions favored it. So I think that's why we need to sort of recognize that. that and I know EU is looking into this as well, like what kind of social sector do we have in transportation? So trade, to create better jobs is, of course, one part of our job to make sure that these jobs are good jobs, that you can go home and have a night with your family. But just on the electrification, which is always our main platform, we always have that. I spoke to the local, so we have also manned electric trucks. And uh, I spoke to a local carrier partner that drives for us, and they have more applicants for since they went electric. They have more female applicants since they went electric. So I think it's also part of doing that journey to clean, to clean the business up and say, okay, we're going to be sustainable. We're going to have a good working life. You're going to have, you're going to participate and contribute to a better climate and. So I think the, the sector has just started that journey. So, but so far, that's why even you know, local carrier partners, they're not afraid of us. They work with us. As you said, we can connect. How can, can we help you and your service? So I think in the new economy, if you could call it that, the transport economy, logistic economy, we benefit. But of course, there will be losers somewhere. I don't know. But the one we, we work upper end, <laughs> you know, high quality, high products, you know, good services. And those end, we don't compete. We help each other. So how can you help me? And uh, so I think that's a really good thing to remember that, of course, uh, there's, if, if you like someone like, the, we, we have a YouTube channel, and we're actually interviewing the first remote operator in the US that we hired. And she's been on the road 30 years in the US. And she now changed. And she tells that story, why she thinks this is a better job. So, but just to make sure that, um, we need to ensure that. For us, that's an important part of our company. <coughs> so obviously, there will be still jobs for the people who have been working uh, in the sector. Uh, if we still keep with the qualification of uh, the people on the labor market, you are quite a new player on the market compared to Skoda, for example. Where do you see the major difference? What made you successful in the field where others may not have been successful? How do you seek and search for the people? What kind of qualification you require from the people? So you won't have pools of engineers who have been highly qualified. The best start was not to take from autonomous industry. So we have hired from uh, Spotify, from uh, Airbnb, Tesla, as all other stakeholders. So how can you take that service that you provide that is excellent in, if you would come into us? So that was the start of the company. Now, of course, now we actually assemble trucks. So now we have hired other competences. But I think it's very important for sectors to sometimes 
time invites other people into your table to say, if you would work here, what would you do with that product? So that's been part of it. But of course, we are a software company. We hire lots of software engineers. Uh, we are now getting into more to the autonomous, uh, sorry, the vehicle um, technicians. Uh, but basically, um, very qualified people. But you have to sign on that you share a uh, climate goal. So it makes it very attractive, though, for young people to work with us. Because many young people want to work with companies that do have an ambitious climate agenda. So um, in that way, we've been fortunate to have uh, been able to recruit uh, well. But we have people working for us for many, many countries, of course. And what we do, I just wanted to add what you were saying, we work with universities all over Europe. And we invite them to join us for partnership and for uh, traineeship. And uh, so we work with many universities around Europe because we also see responsibility to be early, to invite people on board to learn from what we are doing. Thank you. When we talk about labor, about skills, there is a question for Škoda Auto. Uh, Natasha, how do you deal with that? Uh, everybody knows Škoda Auto. Many people would love to work for you. But despite that, uh, you have to also transform uh, quite substantially into the digital world. Uh, and people have different expectations, different approach uh, towards work. And most of the innovation uh, based uh, on which um, um, Einrider is uh, based is related to certain freedom. Uh, how does your company work? with that. Well, Pia said it nicely. Uh, they look for people who share their goal. And we also have uh, this high objective. Transformation of the automotive is very interesting and very attractive. Uh, and people will say, OK, I'll join the automotive industry and I'll try to transform it into a software company. Also. Uh, we know that uh, to find people who would be software developers, uh, it's not an easy task. So we also try to help. And this week, or last week, we opened the uh, Open Prague 32, which is a nice concept a license uh, from France. It is based on peer-to-peer -peer software development learning. So um, people uh, support each other, share knowledge, and uh, actually fully developed uh, projects. So we try to find a way how to offer reskilling or um, upskilling. Uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, so. Uh, hopefully, also, the state will work on improving IT literacy uh, to have it covered uh, throughout the whole system, starting in kindergartens all the way through to universities, so that people can find job easier on the labor market. Thank you. We are slightly under time pressure. Now I would like to invite Matze Gis from uh, the Motor Transport Institute who will share with us uh, information about uh, their institute and how could it uh, help with the transformation. He's from Motor Transport Institute from Poland. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Chairman, dear uh, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's conference is very interesting and this knowledge you, uh, you talk about is very important for us also. And from my side, from my country, uh, the electrification is uh, now the most important. Uh, in, uh, th I think uh, in the end of this month, we will be able to manage about uh, 5,000, uh, 50,000 electric cars. And in 2025, it will be about 300,000 cars. So 
it's I think quite good, uh, but also can be better. But uh, about uh, anonymous car, I think uh, this is our future, and we must uh, think globally. Therefore, in uh, our institute, we talk uh, with customer, with drivers, and also. Uh, tested uh, the solutions of the production of the cars pro uh, producers of uh, anonymous cars and uh, try to uh, manage the legislation problem because uh, nowadays in Poland we don't have any uh, legislation uh, legislation in this case and uh, we must uh, be prepared to to drive these cars in, in our roads. And this is a big problem because uh, people are scared uh, with this car and, and we must so, uh, show them that uh, th there is no afraid because this is our future and uh, therefore we manage uh, a lot of tests of these cars. This, uh, in our way, because, for example, Skoda takes this test also, but uh, we as a separately institute must do our way, and uh, the both ways are good, and it must be this, this way uh, that uh, one checks another. And uh, therefore, uh, in a few years from now, I think will be the first cars in Polish roads, because we try to takes uh, first steps in registrations and takes some uh, in in few cities takes a few routes to test these cars and for example to delivery and so and so mm, uh, and I think in future uh, we will able to uh, uh, we are able to uh, save the time because in cars today <laughs> we uh, stopping uh, traffics and so and so. This is uh, hours in cars, and in this time we can spend with, um, I think, a little bit nicer than uh, <laughs> listen to radio and uh, be angry to another driver to how he drives uh, on the roads. So thank you very much for uh, for my side. Uh, it was pleasure to be here today and have few minutes to say about Polish situation. So thank you. And see you later. Ači, thank you. Takže ne předtím, než nám. And uh, before the time is up, I have uh, a question, the last question for all the panelists. Uh, we talked about uh, the future technologies, how to get there, but we have not covered. Um, the question what the world is going to look like in 20, 30 years, uh, will there be electric vehicles or autonomous uh, vehicles or there will be no vehicles at all? What do you think? And I would uh, first ask Marek Novak and then the rest uh, of you and a strategic look uh, by Martin Russ to conclude our discussion. Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, so quickly, I believe we'll have smart autonomous vehicles, we'll have uh, cars with a zero carbon footprint, so I'm not saying e-vehicles, and I also expect that the traffic as such will change. Um, I want to thank Škoda Auto for telling us uh, how to actually uh, deliver goods um, uh, by another way. And it's really smart mobility. Uh, it all starts with delivering goods. Uh, and then I believe that we'll be able to adapt our way of behaviors and then we'll deal with also the carbon footprint of a human being. So Natasha, will we have vehicles to which uh, the goods will be delivered in 10 or 20 years? Uh, give us uh, both estimates. It's a difficult question. I believe that in 10 years there will be vehicles 
and maybe it will not be uh, well we will not call it vehicles but we'll talk about mobility and we'll keep talking and having mobility even after 20 years and um, all the manufacturers will deliver mobility to their customers so that the customers are happy and the vehicle is not only about the carbon footprint but it's uh, about you know allowing us uh, to travel to meet with family members to enjoy life and we'll have uh, what mobility brings in 10 and 20 years future of uh, passenger vehicle i think uh, you still have to laugh at least uh, inside because you uh, supply the heavy mobility the trucks those solutions that uh, presumably will always be there so what is your vision of the future what do we what do we see in 20 50 years so will there be your trucks Passenger cars, will it be something totally different? What is your vision? Is your company, what is the end goal? For, for, we are in heavy duty vehicle for a reason. It constitutes 7% of the world's climate emission. That's why we picked that sector. It needs to do its job better. So we know this will work. And, and, and I always get this question, how fast and when? And uh, when we started with electric, as someone said, there's so many misperceptions that said there was actually a competitor that have now changed their mind. But they said, like, you can't even transport crisp ships, you know, the small light ones, with electric. Now the first, this is two years ago, they now produce them to drive heavy duty goods on electric trucks themselves. So this is how quick it goes. The development in batteries, of course, that's super important and, and all that, and same with autonomous, so, but I mean, Let's see how it goes. It, it will be safe. It will, we will start small, as we said, and scale from there, where we find it safe and, and benefit from, from techniques. So it would definitely be something you would see. I actually walked around here. It's a fantastic environment. You have chargers for bikes, for cars. Why don't have an autonomous bus here? We have that in my university where I live. An autonomous bus that go between uh, houses. This would be a per perfect environment. So. I think start small and scale, and let's see if it went, where we end up, if that will be everywhere or not. I don't know that answer, but definitely you will see that every day, I would say. Every day in your life, you will either be in one or you would see an autonomous car. That's for sure. So the future uh, is bright, at least from what it's seen from Pierre. Thank you. Martin, what is the vision for Austria Tech and for Austria uh, in those two areas? I think for us it's also, I think I take on on this bright future with a really diverse landscape of mobility options. I think we see, I call it purpose driven fleets, because I think it's not just having one vehicle that I have to own that has to fulfill all the purposes. But it's, it, if we address this utilization, then we have to differentiate, otherwise it will not work. And I think this is the first thing. What we see, of course, b because we must, is yes, it's all decarbonized. I fully share the perspective. Not all will be electric. There will be other means that we actually have no clue about how we, let's say, maybe there's the flux condensator, what we have learned in the movies in the 80s. Uh, maybe, maybe it's something totally different. But I think it's it's... It's still something where digitalization, I think, is a powerful changer, also towards participation, towards customer experiences. This is what we see. I think this is what we don't or should not forget. The, the cake will look different, but the cake should be bigger. This is our perspective. It, the mobility market will grow, especially if we do it service-oriented. This is what we see also in our perspectives and strategies. And because mobility delivers values. Yeah. And so it's a nice twin of digitalization. And this is, I think, what we should remind ourselves. And, um, but it's also, and I think we will shift hopefully in 20, no, in 10 years, the discussion from uh, away from powertrains and talking about power to the people. Because I think it's, it's about all the citizens and not just some of the citizens that should be enabled. And, and entitled to do certain things uh, because the time of forerunners in 10 years is over. 
we have to address the masses. And then the one thing is scale, but transformation or successful transformation, this is another belief in our strategies, is local. So engage with local community, engage with local businesses, and there we are again. Learning, education, upskilling, and so on. I think for, because transport is not just the heavy truck driver. Transport is in there as a secondary task for hundreds of different jobs. And if we do this autonomous, I think it will change the way we work and live dramatically. And so the first thing, we have to change the way to plan the cities. Because in a way we have to plan for robots. Because the robots, they should help us out there in the future. Maybe this is, scares you a little bit, but I think, think about that. I think this is, this is what will the future look like where those little things and big things are there to help us. And I think this is our or my personal biggest vision. And I, I studied city planning and I could never imagine a climate neutral city, but we have to go there with transport and with other things. But transport is the facilitator for all that shift because it moves people physically and emotionally. Thank you. Martin, thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to all the panelists uh, and thank you. Uh, the panel on smart e-mobility uh, is over. And tomorrow there will be a second day. So thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for staying with us. And also thank goes to all watching us online. And the smart mobility means lots of uh, opportunities for our companies, businesses, and for people, um, specialists, but also for users. Although it's not easy, but I think that there is a bright future. Thank you very much, and good evening. Let me thank our panelists. Also on my behalf, it was a wonderful conclusion. And I'm here just to close today's program and invite you for networking. And tomorrow, you can join us already at 8. And on stream, we will be back starting from 10 AM. With this, I would like to thank Marek Novak, Natasha Oberman, Pia Berglund, Martin Russ, and Zdeněk Petzl for excellent moderation. My name is Sarah Pollack. We have heard many interesting topics, starting from Bitcoin through health care up to cooperation between public and private sectors. What is clear and obvious, multi-sectoral approach is a common man in the street should be able to understand what digitalization brings about so that they can find their way and live their lives in the society. Now, let's move to networking. Thank you. Thank you.